uh, from the Horse Racing Committee. What I'll do right now is I will call the Horse Racing Committee of Wednesday, July 15th, 2018, to order. It is 2.01 p.m. Uh, what I will do is take a roll call of the members of the committee. I'll call your name and then ask you to just um, state your name and then obviously state your designation in terms of your representation for the committee. Uh, and I'd start with Ms. Katanak. Hi, and I'm on my phone here, so please bear with me as I'm fumbling. Okay. Um, but I'm Emily Katonik, and I'm from the Treasurer's Office. Okay. And Commissioner Cameron? Yep, Gail Cameron, representing the Gaming Commission. Okay. Mr. Savage? Yeah. Hi, Joe Savage, Thoroughbred Horseman and Breeders. Okay. Mr. Goldberg? Thank you. Uh, Peter Goldberg, uh, representing the Standard Bred Horseman and Breeders. And I'm Brian Fitzgerald the chair of the committee. Uh, the next item on the agenda is, oh, excuse me, I apologize. I do need to make an announcement. Um, and um, the announcement is that given the unprecedented circumstances resulting from the global pandemic, Governor Baker issued an order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law to protect the health and safety of individuals interested in attending public meetings. In keeping with that order, this committee uh, has convened using remote collaboration technology. Uh, there will be a few considerations uh, that I would like to note. Uh, any votes that we will have will be taken by roll call, and I will ask each member to register their vote, if any, individually. And secondly, I'd ask that uh, Everybody except the committee members to please mute themselves to help keep background noise to a minimum. And third, just as a notice to everyone, this committee, this meeting is being recorded. Uh, so we will move on then with the agenda. And I, uh, the next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes, which is from our June 3rd, 2020 meeting. And I'd ask if the committee members have had an opportunity to review those minutes. Yes, I have, Mr. Chairman. Okay. I have as well. Yes. Are there any comments or changes that need to be made to those minutes? No. I don't believe so. Yeah. Okay. Nope. So I would entertain a uh, motion to approve the minutes. Um, with any clerical uh, errors to be corrected as necessary. I would, I would, I would move, Mr. Chairman, to uh, accept the minutes of the last meeting as, as written. Second. All in, um, so what we'll do now then is um, we will take a roll call vote then of these minutes. So, uh, Ms. Katunuk. Yes. Commissioner Cameron? Aye. Mr. Savage? Yes. Mr. Goldberg? Yes. And I register aye. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, so the next item on the agenda is the um, review of the Racehorse Development Fund uh, updated revenue. Uh, what I had asked was that there just be presented to each of the committee members um, the updated revenue figures as they are listed with the uh, Gaming Commission. Uh, just to kind of give you some background, there's the um, 2019 uh, annual report, which kind of gives a summary of all of the total disbursements that were made out of the uh, Racehorse Development Fund. Um, and then what I would ask uh, the committee members to just do in terms of the packet, there is the full listing. It's about 12 pages of the revenue fund. Um, I would ask that you just look at page one, which kind of gives you an indication in terms of the history of the fund 
as well as all of the allocations uh, that have been made and the actual amounts that have been paid and the balance that is noted. Uh, in addition to that, if you look at the last page, which is page 12 of that handout, that kind of gives the updated figures and as you can see, obviously, uh, April and May, and I'm sure uh, um, going go funds going in, into uh, zero collections that are going into the fund. And so I believe there probably is, and I guess I would ask, is Dr. Lightbound on the call? Yes. Okay. All right. Yes, um, I am. Just uh, I kind of had the figures right now. Currently, is somewhere somewhere just north of about three and a half million dollars at this time, based on what was located out of January, February, and into March. Um, do you anticipate that that's roughly where the fund is at this point? Um, well, the, the the total fund you saw on that first page where it's got the seventeen. The seventeen. In it. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. And um, obviously, there's going to be a um, point. We're always, um, you know, maybe a month or so behind on the payments once they come into the gaming commission and and they go out again. So um, fairly recently, disbursements were made. Um, Everybody should have gotten the money through um, the March, um, you know, 15th date or whatever the date was around there that the um, casinos uh, were shut down. So that money has gone out. And now there'll be uh, obviously the several months um, break where there wasn't any casino action with no money coming out to the uh, funds. Okay. Uh, do any of the other committee members have any questions about the, the, the revenue? No. No. Okay. All right. Um, seeing none, then we'll move to the next item on the agenda, which is item four. Uh, and again, I guess I would just call on briefly on Dr. Uh, Lightbound to um, talk about the update with respect to the horse racing schedule at this point in time? So I'm uh, happy to be able to report that Plain Ridge has opened for live racing. They opened on this past Monday the 13th. Um, they're scheduled to run through uh, the end of November. November 27th is their last day. Um, doing some rough uh, numbers. They've missed about uh, 40 some days due to the COVID. Um, they've got about 70 that are on schedule still. Uh, there are some uh, spots in the schedule where uh, we're racing uh, three days a week. So it's possible that Pine Ridge may end up adding some days in there. It would be fairly easy to add another day of racing depending on the horse population. Um, and then there, there are some months once you get into September and October um, where we're already going to be racing four days a week. It might be a little more difficult to have the enough horse population then. So um, right now, um, I'm not sure what their final number of racing days will be. Um, it should be at least the 70, and then, <clears throat> like I said, they may add some uh, days in there to make up for the days they've missed. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do the committee members have any questions about that? Dr. Lightbaum, uh, if I could, I've heard that there's some possibility of the standard bridge racing past the end of November. Is that at least a possibility at this time? Sure, that's also a possibility. I mean, harness racing races throughout the winter in a lot of places in Ohio and New Jersey, for example. So it's, weather is not an issue, is that correct? Well, I, I know um, Steve O'Toole really likes to be done um, by that November date. Um, we do get some weather in December that makes it difficult and with the shadow that the um, track projects onto um, one side of the racetrack that freezes up a little 
more than the others, but certainly, um, you know, they do race into the winter in other tracks. So it's, it's a possibility, at least, at least a possibility. Yeah, it's definitely a possibility. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, all right, see none then. Um, I also wanted to call upon Attorney Grossman. Attorney Grossman, thank you for attending uh, this meeting. Um, I wanted to uh, see if you could just provide us with a quick legislative update, um, if you will, or you can, um, you know, just in terms of, in terms of there was certain laws that apparently um, uh, have been enacted recently and then um, just to provide a, a brief update in terms of the uh, horse rate resource development fund legislation. So. Sure, I'd be happy to do that. Thank you, Mr. Chair and good afternoon, everyone. Nice to see you all. Uh, uh, let's see, I'll, I'll run through all of the uh, legislative items that are on the agenda um, one by one. So the first two, um, or chapter 106 of the acts of 2020. It's actually also known as House Bill 4817. That is uh, what ex essentially extended the racing laws until July 31st, 2021. Uh, as you may uh, know, the racing laws have been on a year to year kind of basis for some time now and the legislature and the governor typically extend them by one year periods. Last year, I think it was six months, but um, this year it went out to July 31st. That covers 128A and C and all of the special acts that allow for the continuation of the licenses of Suffolk Downs and Wonderland and Raynham Park to uh, simulcast um, and a couple of provisions of the Gaming Act that uh, apply to horse racing as well. So that was all extended out uh, for another year through next July. House uh, 13 and Senate 101 are the bills that were actually drafted by the Gaming Commission that would create a new Chapter 128D to replace 128A and C and essentially uh, outline the authority of the Gaming Commission to adopt regulations that cover uh, horse racing, simulcasting, and associated wagering in its entirety. It was intended essentially just to streamline the process and to remove any of the special acts and other things that oftentimes make the regulation of horse racing um, more complicated. Uh, but in any event, those did not pass. Those who were reported uh, officially ought not to pass by committee is the actual language that was used. So those that will not become law, at least this session. H, uh, House uh, 386 would uh, reduce the 9% of the gross gaming revenue that uh, Section 55 of Chapter 23K talks about. Um, that goes into the Racehorse Development Fund, it would reduce that 9% to 4.5%. It would then take the other 4.5% and send it to what's called the Community Preservation Trust Fund. Uh, that bill, though, was referred to the Joint Committee on Economic Development and Emerging Technology. Uh, the committee held a hearing in November of 2019. Uh, no action was taken on it until a study order was issued in February of this year, and there's been no further action on that. Um, similarly, uh, House 387 provided that the comptroller shall transfer up to $10 million each fiscal year if the Secretary of ANF requests from the Racehorse Development Fund and uh, transfer that money into the Community Preservation Trust Fund. That bill was also referred to the Joint Committee on Economic Development and Emerging Technologies. A hearing was held in July of 2019 um, and a study order was issued in February of this year and no further action has been taken on that. Um, those are uh, all of the matters that were um, identified on the agenda. I'm not, I can't think of any other legislative initiatives off the top of my head. Um, but I'm certainly happy to discuss uh, any of those in any greater detail, either here or if anyone would like to discuss offline, I would have you. Okay, all right. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Grossman. Are there any questions from the, from the committee members? 
one. Okay. All right. So moving forward then uh, to the next item on our agenda, which is the review and discussion of industry executive summaries based on uh, based upon uh, updated criteria and racehorse development fund distribution and any recommendations. Uh, so in terms of process for our discussion, um, what I wanted to do was see if um, how the committee members felt about how we should uh, proceed with uh, this discussion based on the uh, executive summaries that have been uh, submitted. Uh, I want to first um, thank uh, each of the representatives from the uh, thoroughbred industry as well as the standard bred industry uh, for their uh, submissions uh, in terms of um, what they've, they've um, put forth in answering, uh, you know, the uh, questions related in the updated criteria. Um, and I guess for the committee members, um, I just want to take a sense of where you'd like to proceed. Um, I know that um, for myself, I have uh, specific questions um, uh, from what has been submitted under the summaries, um, and I'm sure you do as well. Uh, so um, I just wanna see if the committee members feel, um, should we uh, entertain uh, questions, um, uh, of each of the industries and whether or not each of the industries, um, you know, obviously we have two representatives from each of the industries on this committee uh, and whether they want to defer to uh, their representatives who may be on the call to help with any details that may uh, provide an answer to our questions. Um, uh, or do they want to hear from each of the committees for a brief period of time and then ask questions? Uh, Mr. Chair, I have always found it helpful in the past when uh, the industry representatives that serve on the committee, um, you know, give a short um, summary of the presentation and why the points that they made in their executive summary, um, what they think is valuable for us to really pay attention to in making this decision. So I've always found that step helpful to have them talk through briefly their um, summary and making the points that they deem. Um, and some of our questions may be answered with that short uh, summary. Okay. All right. Um, that, that, from my view, may, may make a lot of sense. Um, I'm thinking, though, we want to do it category by category. Like, Peter will speak about the 80% purse bucket, and then I will, then maybe we pause or maybe we go to the next one, but I, I think it's probably not, given our new methodology, useful to go through the whole three of them and then the whole three of them. Just that makes a lot of sense. So you'd want to take it category by category? That would be my suggestion. Okay, all right, okay, all right. Uh, Attorney Goldberg, are you? I'm, I'm fine with that. Oh, yeah, that I, I, okay. just, I, 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 I chuckle at Commissioner Cameron's idea that two lawyers can be brief. But, um, well, you noticed I kept emphasizing that just to make the point. And that's why I divided it into three buckets. It won't seem like one long oration. That, that, no, that was, that was, you stole my thunder as that was going to be my opening line about trying to not just <laughs> rehash reams of statistics. So Correct. I yeah. agree a thousand percent. So yeah, that's that's fine, Mr. Chairman. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, Ms. Katonik, do you want to, are you okay with that process as well? So. Yeah, I'm okay with that approach because I think we're hearing from um, both the thoroughbreds and the standard breads that they're open to splitting um, bucket by bucket. Okay. So I'd be okay with that. All right. Okay. All right, so then uh, if we're going to take it category by category, then I would ask uh, which category do we want to start with? Do we want to proceed with talking about health and welfare benefits uh, first uh, or breeding or 
the um, first allocation? I, I think the executive summaries ended set up as yeah. first, first breeding and then health and welfare, and that seems logical to me as an order. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. I, I would I would agree with Tony Tavage. So we'll uh, begin uh, then, um, and I guess uh, in terms of starting, then uh, why don't we start with the um, Mr. S Attorney Savage? Why don't you begin uh, speaking about the thoroughbreds position in terms of their executive summary on the purse allocation? Sure. Um, so just stepping back where we are at the moment overall for the race of the fund is a 65-35 split across all categories. Um, and our overall uh, request to the committee today would change the overall split 59.2 for the standard reds and 40.8 for the federal reds. So that's like the aggregate numbers um, because you know, thinking about this, you've got two breeds, you've got a mandate to develop each breed, and sort of instinctively, as a matter of common sense, 50-50 would be the starting point. Um, and then there would be reasons um, to, to vary from that. But so overall, our recommendation is accepted as to each category does a modest change from 65-35 to 59.2 to 40.8. Um, as to the purse allocation um, uh, category, the thoroughbreds are not asking for a change um, in that one, 65-35 um, standard bred thoroughbred. Um, you know, this that alone, um, if the committee were to adopt it, gives the standard breds more than half of the entire racehorse development fund at, at 52%. And there, you know, really should be a good reason for the committee to put their thumb on the scale that way. And we're not objecting to it because the historical analysis of this category, and, and Mr. Goldberg's been the uh, primary proponent of it, but I agree with it, is you compare the last three years to each other. In other words, comparison here is how do the numbers in 2018 look as compared to the numbers in 2019? And there's been no material change. Well, we may disagree as to how the committee got to 6535. There's nothing in the record that would give a reason to change it um, when you compare the, the, the relevant metrics of 2019 to 2018. Um, there's some additional reasons not to change it. Um, one is that giving a larger percentage to the standard breads has not and will not increase live handle. Um, this committee back in 2014 hired an expert, Dr. Ray, and she found in her report that for every 1% that you increase live handle for the standard breads, it's 0.075% um, or every 1% of purse leads to 0.075% increase in handle. Um, another way to look at that is, is the, the, the GTR numbers don't move at Plain Ridge on race days. Um, and with like $1,270 or $1,300 in live handle on each race, it, it, it basically confirms there's, there's no one there. In other words, it's not a, a thing that changes depending upon the person. So that would be an ineffective expenditure of money if you were to increase um, their purses. A second thing, that's, that's meaningful to the benefit to the Commonwealth is, is where does the purse money that you give standard breads go to? And it, it leads to money going largely out of state. Um, if you look at the 2019 from the perspective of horses, 47% of the standard bred active mass breads were owned by mass residents. In other words, most of them are owned by non-mass residents. If you look at it from the owner's perspective, only 25% of the mass standard bred owners are Massachusetts residents. So the, the money that, that goes there won't have a positive impact 
and won't stay in the Commonwealth. Um, and and there's, there's no benefit to give it to them when by doing so, it erodes the incentive that the thoroughbreds have from their 35% piece to um, encourage investment in a new track. And you heard this, the testimony of the various people that are um, engaging in, in, in um, developing a thoroughbred racetrack. And, and we've been conscious of this all along. I mean, we could have gone to the commission for higher purses in 2019, and it would be consistent with other racetracks around the country, but we didn't, in part to be responsible of preserving that fund as an incentive um, for investment. And, you know, fortunately there's been a little bit of good news last week. The Sturbridge project was voted on by the selectmen affirmatively out there. So that moves to the next step of the conservation committee. So there's, there's activity there. And as the people testify, that's dependent on this fund um, being available. Um, the standard bread executive summary has a couple of arguments for, for an increase. Um, uh, first, they say on, on page three that the thoroughbreds did not spend any of the racehorse development money in 2019. Um, and that's not accurate. I mean, we everybody knows we had six racing days and we see Alex's numbers. And, and so we spent money from the racehorse development fund that the Gaming Commission gave us. Um, and, and both for um, the actual live racing on the six days at Suffolk um, and uh, uh, another $600,000 to support the breeders in their racing at Finger Lakes. Um, they, they make an argument in their executive summary that, that basically says the thoroughbreds get enough from ADW and simulcast. Um, and to finance all the purses out of that. And that they've apparently assumed that's what the thoroughbreds are doing. And, you know, once again, that's inaccurate. Um, you know, historically thoroughbreds got three to 7% of simulcast and ADW, but after Suffolk closed, it's 0.05%. There's no money there anymore. And what money was left over about $800,000 was used by the thoroughbreds in 2019 to put on the event, like to pay for use of Suffolk Downs and uh, folks that worked it and whatever. I mean, none of that money went to purses. So this is just a kind of, I don't know where they got this idea, but it, it also is, is inaccurate and not um, a reason to increase uh, their share. Um, they say on, on page four, that, that um, it should be looked at that, that the race days are, are a significant benefit to the Commonwealth. And the, the actual argument, just to quote it, is there's obviously a much greater economic benefit to the Commonwealth from 153 SB training racing trainers racing 108 days and stabling slash training for 300 plus days, as opposed to 125 TB trainers racing a grand total of six days in Massachusetts. And then there's a helpful exclamation point. Um, so the implication of that paragraph, which is incorrect, again, it's not accurate, is it implies the horses are here for 300 days and they aren't. They almost all ship in and ship out, and the standard breads have given no actual data on that. They just assert, as they say in that paragraph, it's obviously a much greater economic benefit without demonstrating it. Um, they, they cite their own expert report, they say at page five and six, table six and seven, for the concept, quote, obviously much greater ec economic benefit. So you go to the expert report expecting it to say something like obviously much greater economic benefit, but what their expert actually said is, and I'll quote it, quote, however, given the limitations discussed above regarding active versus issued licenses, for the 2018 season, we have no method 
to quantify racing related employment for each sector. So it, it's actually the opposite of obviously economically beneficial. Their expert was candid that they have no method to quantify racing related employment for each sector. Um, their final argument or next argument is that you know, even though they're already eighth in purses in the nation, they need to be even higher up as compared to other racetracks. And I see Mr. Goldberg shaking his head because I think they say they're 11th or 14th, but whatever the, the, whatever the number is, the point is they say there's an economic development reason for the Commonwealth for them to be higher comparatively to other racetracks. Now, they, they don't give any data or rationale as to why moving from wherever they are on the list, the number one, would in any way benefit the Commonwealth. I mean, we know it won't lead to an increase in life handle. We know it won't lead to an increase in in-state ownership. It won't change race days. It'll just mean by increasing the purses that way, more Massachusetts money flows out of state. So I think the four arguments they make, uh, three of them are inaccurate and two of them are unsupported. Um, and the fact that back to the bottom line, there is no change in any relevant metric from 2018 to 2019 that as to this category, the committee ought to leave it right where it is, 6535 in their favor. Thank you, Attorney Savage. Uh, Attorney Goldberg. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. So I am gonna to try to be brief and, and again, not go through either of our arguments uh, in, in detail because there's been a lot, there's been an executive summary provided by the industries, there's been a position paper presented by the industries, and then all the metrics in the uh, outline provided by both industries. And I know everyone in this committee is good at reading and can figure the, the math. The gaming statute uh, was passed back when it was passed to help Massachusetts and its communities and its residents. It wasn't, we didn't institute gaming in Massachusetts to help any industry. It was helped to bring in, it was, it was passed to bring in financial revenues to education for teachers, to the police and firemen in the communities and for general funds for infrastructure repairs and updating. There were tons of hearings, votes required of all the towns that were going to get gaming in their communities. They had to pass, all the host communities had to have hearing after hearing about these issues. The Mass Gaming Commission didn't give, didn't give Steve Wynn the first licensed casino license because they liked Steve Wynn or they liked his company. They gave it to him because at the time they felt that Wynn was, was able to do the best for Massachusetts, to bring in the most revenues for Massachusetts, not to be the best gaming company out there. The Resource Development Fund is part of the gaming statute. It wasn't, it's not a statute designed to, to bring horse racing to Massachusetts or only to prop up an industry. It was there to maximize benefit to Massachusetts, the local towns, residents, and to encourage investment and reinvestment uh, in Massachusetts by the uh, all the shareholders, the stakeholders in both horse racing industries. The metrics are clear. If you look from when we started our first meeting in August of 2012 till today, every single metric for the standard breads has gone up and every single metric for the thoroughbreds has decreased. It's just the way it is. If you look, um, you know, 2019, standard breads only received a smidge over 60% of the resource development fund, although it's now 65%. That wasn't en enacted until November of last year. So there's been very uh, little extra money. Live race days, this committee determined years ago, uh, is very, very important. 
standard breads continue to increase them, not only increase live race days, but the number of races. Thoroughbred, obviously their race days from 2018 to 2016 uh, was down from uh, eight to six. So it was down 25% over that one year. The standard breads are using all their money. The point about the thoroughbreds not using the money is they have a surplus in their account. Whether that money they use this year was from this year's allocation or from 2014, doesn't matter. We don't know. I understand Attorney Savage's point, but the point is, as we go forward, every dollar that's gonna go to this thoroughbreds for purses is going into a slush fund, into their escrow account. It's going to be attacked again. Why wouldn't it? It's been attacked as we heard from Attorney Grossman, in the House bill is already trying to take 10 million a year away from the Resource Development Fund, another bill that's trying to reduce the 9% to 4.5%. So these are real things that are happening because that money is, is for the, on the thoroughbred side, is not being used. Purses are not being used. The unfortunate reality is there are no race dates in Massachusetts in 2020 for thoroughbreds. Their needs for purses are zero. They don't need any more purse money. I mean, it doesn't get uh, any more basic, I think, than that. The occupational the employment numbers, what, what, that, what the expert was talking about was, we don't know exactly how much each person made, how many days they worked, so it's hard to compare apples to apples. We can't compare apples to apples. But my point was very simple. Let's use our common sense, because I think we're allowed to use our common sense in this, in this uh, what we're trying to figure out here. And the common sense is, if you have 150 standard bread trainers racing 108 days, that might bring in more economic benefit to Massachusetts than uh, the same number of thoroughbred trainers racing six days or racing no days. It's just obvious math. Most of the horses don't, don't ship in, that's not true. Most of them are stabled in Massachusetts. There are a lot that ship in, and that's a good thing for Massachusetts. And I mean, I could, I could take one of the, one of the last things I, I wanted to talk about was um, the HHANE membership. If you look at the um, executive summary that, that was provided, a, good, a very good point was made. If you look at the membership statistics, and it's on page nine of the executive summary from 2014 to 2018, what you see is the number of Massachusetts residents who are members of the HHANE has increased 24% since 2014. It's gone up, not down. It's more Massachusetts residents are involved in harness racing since 2014 by 24%. But if you also look, the out-of-state members increased by 229%. That's a very, very, very good thing. Why is that? Attracting outside investment for any organization is a good thing. Uh, I, I happen to represent a, a nonprofit, do a lot of fundraising. Going to the local people in our, in our organization is okay, but there's only so much you have there. Getting people from outside the organization to invest is where it's at. And that's what the standard industry has done really in a terrific fashion since 2014. We've gotten outside people to move from New York, New Jersey, Delaware, Maine, to move their operation and race in Massachusetts. Not a bad thing. It's a great thing. They're taking them or they're driving to Massachusetts to race. They're buying gas at Massachusetts gas stations. They're buying feed. They're using the equipment guys in Massachusetts. They're using the veterinarians in Massachusetts. So that's all a good thing. The occupational numbers, um, again, are just common sense. The live handle issue is a red herring, folks. Live handle is small potatoes. The money that the Commonwealth gets from gambling at the races is de minimis. The take, I don't know, maybe you can correct me, Joe, the, the, the takeout on these bets is about maybe 10% on average. So if a million dollars is wagered, it's about 100,000 to the Commonwealth. So when the thoroughbreds 
handle was a million, about a million five last year. Uh, it brought in about 15, about 150,000 to the Commonwealth. This is de minimis. We're not trying to attract gamblers to Massachusetts. We're trying to attract employees, workers. Go to a racetrack. I, I, I invite everyone here. Come to, come to Plain Ridge. And you'll see who's out on the apron betting on the races. It's old men. That's who's there. Old men. We're not trying to attract more old men to bet their dollars on their, wage, on, on their races. Now go to the backside which is the barn area of the racetrack. You're gonna see probably more women than men and a lot of young people working as grooms, as cleaners, doing every job as veterinarians, trainers, drivers. That's who we're trying to attract into Massachusetts because those people are spending money that's effective for Massachusetts revenues. That's what helps put the dollars into the back into the schools and the firemen and the police and all of that. So the live handle, and if you look at the live handle, I mean, okay, the, since 2014, live handle, the thoroughbred live handle has been down 23% annually. The standard handle, handle has been up an average of 7% annually since 2014. I suggest it's, it's really a red herring though. I'll just finish up about relative needs. Um, we're not eighth in the, you know, my brother says, or his, his summary states that we're eighth in the nation, um, eighth highest in the United States. That's far from the truth. We're 11th in the Northeast region. And if you take just tracks of the same size, we go down even further. We're also, um, still $4 million less a year of the average harness racing track in the Northeast. So wh why is this important? In order to attract the investment from the people in New York, from the people in Rhode Island, Delaware, Maryland, Ohio, wherever it is, to get them to move their broodmares to Massachusetts, to get them to move their racehorses to Massachusetts, to drive in on Mondays, Thursdays, and Wednesdays to race in Massachusetts, we have to offer good purses. They have to be competitive. Why would you drive to Massachusetts to race for less money? It doesn't make sense. So it, it's important, especially in light of the COVID. Look, we're the only game in town now. We have to pay purses this year, folks. We have to pay them. We can't afford the purses to go down as the momentum has been going really well for the standard bread industry. It's going well, it's like the same old thing. It's going well, but there's a long way to go. There's a long way to go for the standard breads and we, we have to keep the momentum. It, it's, it's very, very important. Um, so that's all I'm gonna say about, about the purses. I think it's, um, you know, I could sit here and I could, with all, with all my honesty and good intentions say, we deserve 100% of the purses. Why, why, why couldn't I say that? The thoroughbreds aren't racing in 2020. They're gonna spend zero on purses. We now have to make up a shortfall because the casino, everything was closed for three, four months. So the resource development fund is gonna be a lot less this year than last year. Yes, we're gonna race less days, but there's with the horsemen are trying hard to get as many of those days back, whether it's racing the extra day a week or racing more days, because December and January are days that can be raced. I understand that uh, that there's, there's people that don't want to race uh, in the winter time, those being the racetrack themselves, but the horsemen would like to, and they're going to try to. And I think it's really important not only to keep the amount of the purses the same, but to try to keep that momentum going and increase them. So I, I could ask for a hundred percent. I probably should ask for a hundred percent to be honest, because I think the more that we put into an escrow account, it's just giving ammunition for others to go ahead and take it. And I think it behooves both industries to not keep putting money into an escrow account that might be used someday. Um, I think, though, it, it, you know, 
to be to hear what they're saying, to hear what Attorney Savage is saying. I, I think somewhere in the um, 85 to 90 percent though for purses would certainly be fair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Attorney Goldberg. And, and Mr. Mr. Chair, was it your um, uh, vision that that I would be able to respond, or that an industry representative would speak, or how how did you think we should handle this? Well, in in terms of in terms of rebuttal, uh, I guess I would say you know if if there are points that you want to address, you can address those points, but I do want to try and also um, move on for any questions that the other committee members may have. Um, so then I'll, I'll take a 30 second shot at it and you okay. can cut me off and you can cut me off at 30 seconds. Um, again, again, the focus is 2018 versus 2019. The race days are essentially the same for both breeds. And, and all the other metrics are essentially the same. We were six versus eight, they were 110 versus 108. So nothing changed. Um, the purses, you either accept the idea that it encourages investment or you don't. So there's no reason to belabor that. Um, the common sense argument about it, there's a trainers hanging around coming in and out of state for a hundred days. You know, the actual, there's the metric you can look at, which is W2s. I mean, there's people employed and you can look at it and that favors the thoroughbreds. Um, as to the, the increasing membership in the Harness Race Association, that's, that's folks paying 35 bucks to join an organization you know, where you can get a 10% discount at Holiday Inn Express. That is not yet connected to investment. Like if Mr. Goldberg has data on investment, that's great and it's probably relevant to the committee, but the fact that people paid 35 bucks a year to join a, a racing association um, uh, doesn't do it. Uh, the importance of live handle, that's not me talking, that's the expert this committee hired in 2014. And it's a measure of whether the, the product is attracting customers. And customers are benefit to the Commonwealth. They stay in a hotel, they buy a meal, they do a thing. It's it's true that apparently standard breads are not expanding their footprint beyond elderly men, but that's part of the problem. That's why you wouldn't throw more purse money at something that's not expanding. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'll, if I could take 15 seconds to reply. Sure. Dr. Ray's report was done in 2014 or 15. At the time, this committee, and I think Commissioner Cameron can back me up in this, spent hours and hours not only reviewing that report, but we were on a conference call with Dr. Ray and questioned her. There were, there were error after error after error in her data. There were many mistakes and we basically as a committee decided to discredit the report and not give it any weight in our decision. And that was back in, whenever it was written, 2015, 2013. I think it was, it was before the 2014 vote, so it had to be around 2013 or 14. So the, the, the reliance on Dr. Ray's metrics don't work. All right. Okay. Uh, other committee members, I guess I'd ask uh, if you have any questions about what you've just heard from, from each of the representatives of the thoroughbred and standard bred industries. Um, yeah, Mr. Chair, I just had a couple of um, points, really. I, I don't know that they're actual questions, but um, I think uh, Mr. Savage's point about employment numbers, I do think that's difficult to make that argument because how long are these folks employed? So W-2s may not accurately reflect that. Um, if you're employed for two weekends as opposed to a full racing season, I do think that makes a difference. Um, uh, when we talked about the standard bread need for um, uh, more purses this year, the one point that we didn't make was that there is a significant amount of carryover money going into this season that really can um, 
uh, kind of replace the monies that were not being made early in the season. And I think Dr. Lightbound probably has the exact number, but it's a significant amount of money that was carried over for purses this year. Um, and we received that information earlier um, in a presentation from Mr. O'Toole to the, to the uh, Gaming Commission. Um, and I think, I think when we talk about um, standard breads not attracting a new customer base, I actually think that probably applies to both breeds, frankly, that um, the older gentlemen that were mentioned, uh, I think we would see those older gentlemen at uh, any of the uh, simulcast facilities, whether it be a standard bread or a, um, or, or a thoroughbred, um, so it, it just, I think that argument applies to both sides. So just a couple of points I think that we, that weren't talked about yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that, um, Commissioner Cameron. The W2 people are year round people. They're tellers, they're wait staff, whatever. The people who came in specially for the festival were 1099. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. the, the so you're talking about the standard bread, you're talking about the uh, simulcast folks yeah. that are there okay yeah. i didn't realize you were both work live racing um yeah if you were i think you might have been or i don't know if you were at the festivals in i was six days but the crowd was not elderly there were ten thousand people there and there were young people and other kinds of people and when i go to saratoga and i go to del mar and i go to keeneland thoroughbred racing is in a dramatic transformation in terms of the age um demographic of who's coming out i, I don't know that it's well, I, I guess I was talking about the um, most of the year with thoroughbreds, we're talking simulcast only. So I, I'm talking about that population. I do agree that a festival is a bit different because it is a festival. It's not every every week racing and um, the crowds that were there when there was full-time racing at, at, um, at Suffolk Downs was, was diminished as well, frankly, when it was a full-time racing season. Understood. Mr. Mr. Chairman, can I make one comment, please? Sure. Another big issue that, you know, when, when Tony Savage talks about the, the tellers, the simulcast tellers, and those people who are working the simulcast, those people are not included in our numbers for the standard bread side. When Plain Ridge Park was taken over by Penn Gaming, all those people became employees of Penn Gaming, the tellers, guy running the hot dog stand, the restaurant workers, the cleaners, all the, those people are not in our numbers. If we go back and add in the Penn Gaming employees that work at Plain Ridge Park, the numbers will be off the charts. Actually, so my, my memory is to compare boring. apples to apples, you got to be careful and, and, and look at it that way as well. My, my understanding was there were four people that went over from the racetrack to Penn Gaming. Well, that, that would be incorrect. Uh, Attorney Katanek, do you have any uh, questions or comments for either of the uh, representatives? No, thank you. This overview was very helpful. Okay, all right. Um, I do have a, a, a couple of questions um, and I guess, Attorney Savage, if, if you need to, in terms of um, if Mr. Umbrello is on the call and you want to have him uh, kind of um, help elaborate in terms of uh, the answer to this question, um, that would be uh, greatly appreciated. Um, one of the things that I noted from the executive summary uh, was essentially that um, we had asked as one of the criteria uh, questions um, of the total purse allocation, how much did each industry not distribute of the above allocation in the past year? Uh, and the response from the thoroughbreds was that it was estimated that somewhere around $4 million was not distributed. And then the comment in that section was, we could have asked for more purse money, but chose not to in order to have a reserve 
necessary to attract investors for future full-time racing. So I just wondered if, if you, either you or Mr. Umbrello could elaborate on that, um, just in kind of terms of telling us the thought process behind that. As my calculations show, just based on what's been submitted, that um, you know the total purses at Suffolk Downs last year would have been somewhere just north of three and a half million. Um, and the total allocation for purse funds from the Racehorse Development Fund was just north of five million. So I just kind of wanted to get some further thoughts in terms of um, the rationale behind um, not requesting those purse funds and setting them aside. So, uh, so thank you very much for that question. And since you're asking rationales and thought processes, um, I'll let the, the people who had the thought process answer it. So far. I'll defer to Mr. Umbrello. Okay. All right. Am I up to mute? No, you're up. You're can everybody hear me? I believe, yeah, we can hear you now. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I do admit with all the criteria we were going through and had to go through, um, and in and, and my mentality, I, I weighed this. So initially, you're correct. Out of the five million that was allocated, I took from the total. Um, we did pay just close to $3 million, so the difference would have been $2 million. But I didn't weight this as a as a heavy factor in in decisioning in the decision on, on determining the split of the purses. So I went off the total allocation of about five to seven million, less than three million. So it was four or five. So I was just quickly estimating, um, trying to gather all the data from all the different data points and put that together. Um, and as as the um, members of the commission know. When we ran the festivals, we could have asked for significantly large amounts of purses or run for more money. Um, but as Alex Winnell, the racing director, some felt that might have been excessive, but we could have just that. We could have ran for more purses, um, try to run for more races throughout the day, but we had restrictions also with, with Alex and the racing director when we could start, when we could end. So we, we kind of, our, our hands were bound and tied. So. Yeah, actually, the full million you can take that down to about uh, two million then, um, or less. Um, but again, it, it's what we couldn't use based on the number of days and the purses that we um, requested to race on those number of days. Did that, did that answer that question? Thank you. Thank you. Any committee members have any questions from that response? No. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Umbrella. Am I guess I'll meet myself back. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. All right. I, I have a, I have a related question, Mr. Chairman, to, yeah. to Mr. Goldberg, if that's permitted. Um. All right. Well, why don't we go go ahead? Go ahead. I don't so, it, following up, uh, Mr. Goldberg, on what uh, Commissioner Cameron said about the significant carryover, that that's about eight hundred and sixty thousand dollars that. The standard breadth have available for purses right now, according to Mr. O'Toole's testimony last week. Was that money that was racehorse development money that was not spent? I'm not sure it was earmarked from the racehorse development fund. It was from the purse fund. My understanding is that was a calculation mistake by someone uh, in, in, in putting the purses together for the races at the end of last year. So. That's my understanding that it wasn't an intentional uh, carryover for any for any reason. Um, I'm I'm just confused by your executive summary says that there's zero that wasn't spent and Mr. O'Toole says there's eight hundred sixty thousand available. I'm just trying to figure out if that's other money or that is money that wasn't spent. Do you want to address that, Mr. O'Toole? I see Mr. O'Toole's on the call. Would you like to address that? I can, if you can hear me. Yes, we can. Yep. Yep, gotcha. So uh, I know Peter likes to think that I make a lot of mistakes, especially when I was training his horses, but uh, Never. <laughs> but this was not a mistake. Um, this was much more calculated than Mr. Umbrella's calculation. Uh, we were going from 108 days to 110 days for this coming season. 
And with the opening of Encore and the uh, diminishing revenues at Plain Ridge of about 15% at the start, uh, we felt that in order to keep our purse account level, that we needed to carry a little bit extra, <clears throat> excuse me, money into 2020. In 2019, we carried 400,000 into the purse account. And so it really was just another $400,000 going into the 2020 purse account. That money is not specifically uh, racehorse development fund money. This purse account has been a rolling purse account uh, before Penn Gaming took over and after Penn Gaming took over. So every year there's either a shortfall or a surplus uh, because it's impossible to estimate, especially with the way the Racehorse Development Fund uh, payments come in, as Alex had mentioned earlier, that they're a little bit behind as they work through the process. So uh, we estimate as best we can, and we wanted to carry over a little bit extra money this going into 2020, uh, not seeing the pandemic on the horizon, but definitely thinking that there might be a little bit of a, uh, a shortage, and we wanted to keep our purses as level as they could from, from year to year. So it was very calculated in what we did. It was not a mistake, and it is not racehorse fund development money specific. Our purse, our purse account uh, is, is comprised of premiums. It's comprised of percentages of ADW. It's comprised of percentages of simulcast handle. It's comprised of uh, live handle and racehorse development fund. What percentage is Racehorse Development Fund? The actual percentage I don't have off the top of my head, but all those all of those funds uh, contribute to our total purse account, and uh, I'm sure at Suffolk Downs, uh, you know, the, uh, the the monies that are generated there, I'm sure they go into the into their purse account as well as all the Racehorse Development Fund money, and the premiums that we pay over there at about. Three hundred thousand dollars a year. Thank you, Mr. O'Toole. I appreciate you correcting my misspeaking. <laughs> thank you for thank you for hearing me. Thank you. All right. So, are there any further comments or questions on the purse allocation category? Hi, this is Paul again. Can I just make one other comment that's related? Um, all right, sure, we'll allow you that, yes. Yeah, just two seconds. There's a misnomer, and Council Grossman knows this, I keep hearing that our funding is escrowed, and it's why I apologize where I didn't focus and sharpen my pencil on this number, two million, four million. That money's not in our account, that money's not escrowed. And it's one of the requests we keep making to the, to the commission, is it needs to get escrowed to protect the thoroughbred industry and the investors. So I want this committee to understand that, that I keep hearing, or Mr. Goldberg makes a reference, it's protected, it's not protected. Thank you. Thank you. That I can just confirm that that is true. The money is not escrowed. It's sitting in, it's in the gaming commission account and set aside. Thank you, Attorney Grossman. No, I, and, I, and I, I never said it was protected. If you misunderstood me, Mr. Umbrello, that's exactly the opposite. I think these monies are not protected and that's a big point. We keep putting money into that unprotected category, it's gonna go bye bye. So I think that's why more money to the purses for the thoroughbreds is not a good thing. According to the statute, the commission has the authority to escrow that money and we'll be addressing that to protect it. And I use referenced it's escrowed. So when I'm questioned if I'm not spending money, I can't spend money I don't have. That's all my my rebuttal was. So whether it's two million, four million or ten million, it's irrelevant. 10 million came in, we only asked for 2 million to race. Could we have asked for four or six or eight? Absolutely, but we didn't. We, we didn't want to be excessive and we wanted to actually preserve it and continue to do that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Umbrello. Okay, all right. At this point in time then, um, uh, if the committee members, um, Mr. Goldberg, did you have another comment or? No, okay. No, I'm all set. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, all right. If there are no um, further comments um, or questions, then I would open it up 
to the committee members to um, discuss whether or not um, they feel that there needs to be any um, uh, adjustment in terms of the allocation uh, of the purse funds at this time. You've heard from Attorney Savage and myself, so I assume you're talking about the other members of the committee. Correct. Correct. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Commissioner Cameron. So, Mr. Chair, um, so it looks like the thoroughbreds are saying keep it where it is, and they have their rationale for that, which is 6535. And if I understand Mr. Goldberg, because it isn't in the paper an exact percentage, but now he's, I think, saying 80% would be appropriate. Um, so we're looking at a difference of a 15% between the two um, position papers and executive summaries. Uh, I, just not, I'm sorry, Commissioner Cameron, no, I don't mean to cut you. I did say 85 to 90% I thought you would said be- said 85, I'm sorry, you did. I said, I, I, said I, we, I think we could ask for 100% would be completely within the realm, but 85 to 90 would be if mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, and I, another, point that I, I do think is it's easy to get ahead of ourselves and say 2020, but we really are looking back, right, to, to 19. Um, and I, when I do look, I do think there aren't many changes from, um, from 18 to 19. So I know that in 20, it's a different story because of uh, the racing days will significantly change from one year to the next. But as far as 18 to 19, um, all the factors that we've seen thought are important over the years and, and with this makeup as well, last year's uh, committee meeting, um, I, I just, I don't see a lot of changes to talk about that big, um, that big, a swing in in the percentages. Mr. Chairman, can I just address the changes question? Of, 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 of Commissioner Cameron, are you through? Yes, I am, Mr. Goldberg. <laughs> if I could, so the changes since the last split, which was November, was one is the thoroughbreds last year said they'll be up and racing within a year. They're not, that's a change. The money that's being kept by the Gaming Commission, the thoroughbred purse money, wasn't, has now become a target of the mass legislature. That's a new change from 2018 to 2019. The breeding numbers, the breeding, well, I, I, I know breeding, we're not talking about breeding now, but it, it's, it's the breeding numbers have changed dramatically. Suffolk Downs has stopped racing. I know we're not looking at 2020 numbers, but we're looking at relative needs as a purse, as a purse metric. And the rel you can't close your eyes to that they're not racing, so there's no needs. Um, there was more racing at Finger Lakes from 2019 to 2018. And it's just um, the race days from eight to six is 25% reduction. I, I know it's not from 3,000 to 2,200, but they the thoroughbreds were reduced by 25% from 2018 to 2019. So 25% reduction, you take away 25% of anyone's salary or income, it's a big one. So I think it's a, it, it's, it's a major change from 2018 to 2019, albeit the number is not huge and I understand, but the percentages are very much changed from 2018 to 2019. Thank you. So, so if I might just very briefly, the, with the exception of whether six to eight is a big change, which seems uh, ludicrous to me, frankly, uh, given the, the live handle that was generated, the purses that were paid, the people that attended, it was, it was no change. The other things that Mr. Goldberg cited are not metrics for this committee to consider. We had a meeting a month ago or whatever it was and set the metrics. And metrics are like not, the dollars might be a target or they're not going to run next year or Suffolk doesn't live here anymore. Those are not the metrics. So I think that's actually a concession that when you have to go to some place that isn't the question, 
to give the answer, it tells you all you need to know about what the right answer is to the differences between 2018 and 19. Attorney Katana. Hi. Further. Yeah, I mean, I would say generally that I, I share the concerns that have been expressed about the funds being swept um, at some point. And, and I understand Commissioner Cameron's point about sort of the relative change year over year. But I do believe that we landed on sort of the 65-35 split and that that was an increase, not necessarily because it was reflective of you know, the status of the industry, but because we wanted to be sort of cautious in our approach in terms of increasing or changing the split year over year. Um, so I guess all things considered, I would be more open to a discussion of a small, um, moderate change to the split, not something sort of maybe as drastic as has been proposed. Um, but I do think that I would be open to it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and I would just echo that. I, I think one of my my concerns is is and and Mr. Stavage, I'll give you an an opportunity to just kind of. Um, further respond but i think one of my concerns is 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 the allocation that was that was made to to the thoroughbreds um, just the concern of the you know setting aside those the the reserves um, um, mainly because um, you know to me it seemed as though and and the the, the figures could be um, Argued based on what's what's there, but you know anywhere from um, roughly you know only whether it's 21 percent, whether it's half of it um, that was distributed for those purses. Uh, I, I just I have a concern about that about the funds not being distributed for um, their intended purpose in terms of you know funding live races. So, um, and I just, I guess it just, I mean, it was, a, a, you know, in terms of what I've heard, it was, you know, in essence, just a, a, a conscious decision to say, well, we're going to set these, these aside um, for those reserves. So um, it was, it was an iterative process with Alex and a discussion of what was reasonable under the circumstances. Um, there are, um, Race tracks around the country that uh, have the same a, a similar situation and run festival racing such as Kentucky Downs that offers million dollar purses for each race and I happen to have a horse that, that won one of those races so it's a lovely thing if you're that person but that may not be the best economic but there's no question here that these funds are being held for their intended purpose. And the intended purpose will be purses when we have a thoroughbred track up and running. Um, and you heard the testimony of the investors. This is relevant. So we, we did, in conjunction with Alex, a setting up the numbers that we thought were reasonable and not piggish. And we knew that the balance left over would be incentivizing investment. And again, if, if people don't accept the incentivizing investment argument, then I get why they would consider moving in the other direction. But I think we heard people discuss that it's real. And it just, to me, it's common sense that it's real because this is a development fund. And what development often is, is placing a bet on future of what the project might be, and et cetera. So that's, that's as I understand it. But just to use your words, Attorney Savage, I don't believe incentivizing investment was one of our metrics either. Relative needs of the breed. That's exactly what I said. Your relative needs for, for right now, for this 2020, are zero. 
Okay. So then is there any further consideration on whether or not the application needs to be adjusted at this time? Are you looking for discussion, uh, Mr. Chairman, or a motion? Um, if there's a motion to be made, a motion can be made. So. Well, let, let me say this. I would agree with, um, with Emily's comments that, um, um, you know, just dealing with metrics and the concern on the back end with um, a, a pot of money that is, um, may not be protected. Um, but the the uh, Emily's thought was that a modest increase, um, you know, uh, I don't want to put words in her mouth, uh, mouth, but it was it was uh, she would consider. So I I certainly would consider as well a modest increase if you know we're we it looks like we're we're going in that direction. So my my point here is that uh, I'd be more comfortable with modest than I would be with with a big swing. The other way. Okay. All right. Okay. So mo modest has traditionally been defined by this committee in our past practice as five percent. Just throwing it. Out. It has. It has. I, I would suggest, uh, since we're talking numbers and modesty, we're only talking about eighty percent. Not we're not talking about the whole. When we talked about five percent. We never defined modesty as five percent, but we use five percent as as the as the movement per year. That was almost based on a hundred percent. Now we're talking about an eighty percent bucket, so that's a little different. I would suggest, in the interest of hearing what uh, Ms. Katonic has said and Commissioner Cameron, um, you know, I've requested an eighty-five to ninety percent increase in just the purses. Thoroughbreds have asked to keep it the same at 65-35. I, I would concede, I would make a motion, Mr. Chairman, that the Horse Racing Committee um, in a, in a, in a would, would change the split of just the purse allocation, the 80% purse money from 65-35% to a 75-25% favoring the standard breads. 75% to the standard breads, 30, 25% to the thoroughbreds. And I think Commissioner Cameron, this um, concession, you know, which I heard you talking about, uh, is right between my 85 to 90% request and the thoroughbreds request of keeping it at 65%. So just so we're all on the same page, if you increase it to 70%, that means the standard breads will get 56% of the entire racehorse development fund just in this category. If you move it to 75%, it means they're going to get 60% of all the money for racehorse development in this category alone. This, this is this is the, the main, this is 80% of the of the fund, of course. So there's a motion then, the motion as I hear you then is to change the allocation to a 75% to the standard breads and 25% to the thoroughbreds. For the, for the purse allocation. For the purse allocation only. Is there a second to that motion? I, I think I'm, I'm more comfortable with a, um, I would be more comfortable with a 5% rather than a 10% increase. I do believe um, there is value to having some monies for new investors. I, I do believe that. I know that that's not a set criteria to look at that, but in the general category of relative needs, I, I do, and I have over the years given some value to that. Um, to that point. So I would be uh, more comfortable with a 5% increase than a 
I move that we change the allocation to 70-30 in favor of the standard breads. I, I will second that motion. Is there uh, the motion being moved then based on a 70-30 split or allocation based on the, the purse allocation? Uh, I guess we'll take a roll call vote on the motion. Attorney Katunak. Aye. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Attorney Savage. Yes. Attorney Goldberg. Yes. And Fitzgerald. Aye. So the motion being carried. Uh, the allocation would be changed for the purse allocation to a 70% to the standard breads and 30% to the thoroughbreds. Thank you. So moving on to the next category, we will talk about the breeding programs and I will start with attorney Goldberg on behalf of the uh, standard breads if you want to make some brief comments with respect to the breeding programs and the executive summary that was submitted thank you thank you mr. chairman so I'm going to try to be brief as I know we're running long yep I think it's important first to think about what breeding is it's not a joke. Breeding is taking a mare, introducing her to a stallion, having a baby, raising that baby, getting that baby to the races and racing that baby. That's what a breeding program is. Breeding. You can look up merriam Webster's Dictionary. That's what it is. That's breeding. The thoroughbreds have no breeding program in Massachusetts essentially no breeding program and haven't had it for years. The standard breads have. And you want to talk about 2018 to 2019? 2018, there were 116 registered broodmares. And you only register a broodmare when you're going to breed it to a, to, a, to a stallion. 116 in 2018 to 141 in 2019. 99 foals were born in 2018. Nine, uh, in 2018, so far, 2019 has been 98 registered. 2019 foals, and the registration still goes on until the end of the year. Standard bred breeding program has done very, very well in the last four or five years. It's very important to understand the thoroughbreds are not paying money to any two or three year old young horses. They're paying breeders awards, stallion awards, aged horse awards. That's fine, they're entitled to do that. And there's, no, there's no issue with that, but that's not a breeding program. There's no reinvestment. If I breed my mare today, three years down the road, there is a baby. Baby becomes two years old, and about three years and four months after the, the mare is bred, the baby races at two, the baby races at three. That's, this is standard bred horses. Once that horse turns four years old, there's no more money. There's no more mass bred money. If I want to stay in the mass program, the breeding program, I have to breed my mare back to another stallion every year. That's how you stay in the Massachusetts breeding program, the standard breads. The thoroughbreds, since they pay 
whether the horse is two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or nine, I can breed my horse, race at two, race at three. I don't have to breed but my mare back. I can just race that, that, that one horse I have, and I can still be getting paid. And most of the money that's being paid out, I think there are a couple of three-year-olds that actually mass bred thoroughbreds that race this year, but most of them are aged horses. It's five-year-olds, six-year-olds, eight-year-olds, nine-year-olds, and that's who's getting paid. That's not the case. And the reason why the breeding program is important is, is because it's labor intensive. It, it's a, it's a industry that brings a lot of benefit to Massachusetts. Because to breed a horse, you need a lot of open space. You need a lot of veterinarian care, a lot of feed care, a farrier care. It's a lot of care and taking care of those babies, from taking care of a pregnant mare, to taking care of a, a young foal. I've done it myself. I, I've, I've pulled the foal out of the mom, stood it up, and took me, taking care of it. A lot of nights, midnight, taking care of these things. It's a very labor-intensive process. The, the thoroughbreds talk about the cost of thoroughbred breeding. I suggest the costs are not that much different. They talk, he talks about stud fees. The average stud fee in, is $40,000 for a thoroughbred and whatever it was, for a standard, 4,000 for a standard bred. That's irrelevant. They're not breeding in Massachusetts. There were two stallions, two mass stallions registered in Massachusetts for thoroughbreds. They're not doing anything. One stud fee is $2,000 and one stud fee is less than that by private treaty. So it's probably $500. The standard bred, and both industries have resident mare programs. You can breed the mares out, I mean, residents, the resident mare program, you can breed your mare to stallions from outside of the state. Both, both can do that. The, the discussion between live cover and artificial insemination is nonsensical. One doesn't cost more than the other. I've done both. I, I've seen live cover. I've seen and participated in, in artificial insemination. The reason why the st standard breds do artificial insemination, the main reason is it's safer. It's better for the mare. A 1,500 pound stallion mounting a 1,200 or 1,000 pound mare is dangerous. A lot of problems can happen. It's safer to do artificial insemination. But the bottom line is the, the cost of breeding are only important if you're breeding. The thoroughbreds had two foals born in 2019. And my information is one in 2020. So two foals as opposed to 100 foals and on up, it, it's not even, it's not even a fair fight. And, and I, I don't understand for the life of me um, how th this isn't understood but understand that a breeding program as the standard breads have been doing for the last, well, doing it for years, but for the last five, six years, uh, the program has increased. And it's, it's in my, you can look at the notes. The thoroughbred foals have decreased 36 in 2013, down to eight in 2018, two in 2019. The standard bred foals, 36 in 2014, 49, 51, 96, 99, and so far this year, going to be well over 100. That's a breeding program that's encouraging, and in fact, it's bringing in reinvestment, keeping open space viable and keeping people working. So, um, you know, I, again, I think, you know, we talked about uh, small increments. Um, I'll just say that, you know, it, it, it's, it's a really disservice to the Commonwealth and the residents to be splitting the thoroughbred, standard bred breeding allocation 65-35. It, it really is. And I'll, I'll end with that. Uh, Attorney Savage, do you want to make any comments on behalf yes. of the thoroughbred industry? 
I do. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Now, again, as we approach this category, you know, we have to do it in mind that we've already given the standard breads 56% of the racehorse development fund. So <laughs> they currently now get 65, 35 of the breeding money. That was never a product of any analysis. That was byproduct or as I call it, collateral damage of the fact that we previously um, felt constrained to just set one number across the board. Um, and I think now this is our first opportunity to, to actually develop a rationale um, for it. But there's, there's absolutely no question, and, and I wouldn't disagree with Mr. Goldberg at all, that by giving the thorough, the standard breads the bulk of the money, it has immensely advantaged their breeding program and has devastated the thoroughbred breeding program. Back in 2013, each industry had about 40 foals. Then the money started flowing to the standard breads as a byproduct split. And you can follow the numbers that Mr. Uh, Goldberg just pointed out. It, it absolutely did exactly what he said. It became overwhelmingly a standard bred breeding program, heavily supported by the, uh, the racehorse development fund. And the changing of the split didn't just devastate the, the thoroughbred foaling program, but there are 38 mass bred thoroughbreds that are racing now that were bred in Massachusetts with the expectation that those breeders and those farms and those stallions would benefit from the program the Department of Agriculture set up that allocates um, awards to those horses. And those owners in Massachusetts of those 38 horses are not getting what they were bargained for because of the, the, the change over the years. Um, it's, it's the thoroughbred breeders need the bulk of this money. The standard bred breeders don't actually need anything for breeding. The first thing the standard breds have that the thoroughbreds don't have is access to the purse money in the 80% category that we just discussed. And in 2019, standard bred mass breds got 2.8 million from that source. In other words, the, the standard bred breeding program is amply supported and incentivized by the 80% purse bucket. The thoroughbreds got zero money from that source because there was no in-state racing. Um, Mr. O'Toole testified last week or, or spoke last week in front of the Gaming Commission about one of the things they're doing at Plain Ridge that relates to this, which is they're favoring mass bred horses in the races down there. And I'm not being critical about, about that. I'm simply pointing out that the general purse fund is being used uh, intentionally by the standard breds to enhance mass breds. Um, the first, I think opening day was July 13th and there were five races on the card at Plain Ridge two days ago, where it was non-mass bred, non-winners of a race running against mass breds who had won a race. And the mass breds won three of, of, of five races. So the, the, the deliberate directing of money from the 80% purse fund is working for the breeding program of the standard bred. And so they already get more of an allocation from that revenue stream than is at stake in this bucket. And so if the goal is to get us back to where we were in 2013, then the thoroughbreds need more of the breeding money. We've got the cost issue that Mr. Goldberg disputes, but we wrote it out in, in detail. We, we've got the issue of it takes longer for a thoroughbred to get to the racetrack and money to be recouped. Um, the frequency with which the, the different breeds can run, the standard breds can run more frequently. So there's, there's barriers to entry on the thoroughbred side that in, even if all of the things were equal would favor giving more money to the thoroughbreds. But really the most 
critical point, I think, is going back to our fiduciary obligation and our duty under the statute to focus on the benefit to the Commonwealth. And for every dollar that this committee provides to support thoroughbred breeding program, 87 cents goes back to Massachusetts. Every dollar that you spend on the standard bread program, 54 cents comes back to Massachusetts. So the thoroughbred, we pay out stallion awards, bonus awards, which are exclusively for Massachusetts people. The standard breads pay owners. The thoroughbred people are in Massachusetts, the standard bread people less so. And I think it's impossible to justify on a public policy or fiduciary basis choosing to give a healthy breeding program that only returns 54 cents on the dollar in, in opposition to a needy, desperate breeding program that returns 87 cents on the dollar. Um, and the standard breads know this because this is the one question in the executive summaries that they didn't answer. They just blew by it. But it's, it's critical, I think, to our obligation to public funds, to, the, to whether it's going back to the Gaming Commission, going back to the governor, going back to the treasurer and saying, like, we spent the dollar where the dollar came back. Um, and so the, the, the one thing that Mr. Goldberg tries to do, I think, to justify um, the, the economic development piece, um, and I don't disagree with him as to all the, the collateral industries that are involved, but they they point in their executive summary, and I guess it's not Mr. Goldberg, it's, it's, it's the brief, um, that they've got the, the larger number of brood mares. I think it's 141 registered. Um, and we can't quite figure out where that number is from, but it's not actually um, particularly material because the, the point, if you read the document, sounds like this is 141 horses living on farms in Massachusetts, and there's a whole, you know, battalion of Massachusetts people working on supporting those mares. And that's just not how it works. And so I just want to walk through so the committee has a common understanding that, that wasn't shared by the, the standard breads. Um, a standard bred mare can come into the Commonwealth pregnant on November 30th and register. The deadline is December 1st. The mare can remain here and drop the foal, typically February, and go back to where they're from. So that's, that's 10 weeks. That's not a whole year. Now, we don't have the data on how many are, are shipping in, how many are here. That wasn't shared with us by the standard breads, but it's, we can't leave unanswered the implication that there's 141 horses here for a whole year generating a lot of jobs, because that's just not um, the truth. Um, and so it, it just, there's no way that argument that there's 141 here for part of a year can outweigh the, the undeniable fact that if you spend a dollar on us, you get 87 cents back for the Commonwealth. And if you spend a dollar on standard breads, you let 46 cents go to Maine or New Hampshire or someone else. So I think it's important and we're asking with all due respect, I mean, please, Let's reverse the policy that's gotten us into this position. Let's protect the money coming back to the Commonwealth. And with adequate resources, the thoroughbred breeding program can thrive. It doesn't need a racetrack in Massachusetts. It, we can race anywhere in the country if we've got the adequate resources to incentivize people to breed, which because of the collateral damage of the way the split eroded has, has not been available to us. So we'd ask for a 65-35 in our favor, particularly in the light of they've already got 56% of the whole fund. Mr. Chairman, do I get my short rebuttal? Short rebuttal, yes. Thank you. <clears throat> just, just not true. Attorney Savage says that their breeding program has been destroyed by the Resource Development Fund. In 2013, there were 36 thoroughbred foals. 
in 2014 and 15, when the thoroughbred industry was getting 75% of the racehorse development fund. Let's remember that. For the first two years, they got 75% of the racehorse development fund. When they got 75%, they got this giant influx of money, their foals dropped to 22 in 2014, and then to nine in 2015. That thoroughbred breeding program didn't stop because of the Racehorse Development Fund changing, changing over to the thorough, to the standard breads. That just, that's just absolute, just not true. They're not true by the numbers. They went from 36 in 2013 to 22 to nine to 10 when they were getting virtually all the money, 75%. He then talks about the fact that the standard breads can use the purse money for their breeders program. So can the thoroughbreds folks. It's in chapter 128, section two, subsection G. They have the same availability to request funds from the licensee from their purse account to put towards their mass bred horses. So that argument does not hold. What they're paying now, with Tony Savage is bragging about they're paying the stallion owners, and they're paying these aged horses money. They're favoring the mass breds. The mass breds get bonuses. So if a if a mass bred wins a race at Fringer Lakes Racetrack, if it's a mass bred, it gets another $5,000. That's the, that's the program that, that, that they're doing. Well, what the standard breds are doing, yes, we're trying to encourage mass breds as well with the aged horse population. Not, we haven't yet decided to pay bonuses, stallion bonuses or breeders awards, but there is, and the race, the different race uh, conditions, the condition sheets, as, as Mr. Savage talked about, yes, some races favor mass bred. So the older horses, are non-winners of, non of a race lifetime get in, mass breds, non-winners of one. Absolutely. I, I lobbied that for, for years when I had mass breds and they were older horses. This is exactly what the thoroughbreds are doing. The thoroughbreds can do the same thing. The breeding program is not designed by the agriculture department. It's designed by thoroughbred breeders themselves or the standard bred breeders ourselves. And I think it's very, very important to, to bear that in mind. It, it, it's, it's the reason why you encourage two and three year olds is to encourage breeding. And the reason why the breeding program for the thoroughbreds has died because they don't have those races and haven't had them. Their, their program is based on these breeders awards and stakes races for, for just mass breads. And if they had a two and three, I suggest if they had a two and three year old sire stakes program like the standard breads do, that would encourage people to spend the three years and four months. There's a lot of misinformation. The resident mayor program for standard breads is the same, thoroughbreds have the same program. It says you can, because in order to, to encourage breeding, if there's no stallions. It's hard to breed to a stallion. The stallions that stand in Massachusetts, the stallion, the two stallions that stand were not good racehorses. The stallions that you can go pay money for and, and breed to are all grade one stakes winners. So it, it behooves you to, to breed outside and get a better stallion. The fact that um, this resident map program, the, the horses don't fall in February. That's a bunch of baloney. If you're lucky, your horse falls in February. Most fall in April, May, June, some in July. I mean, it, it's an 11 month period. So it, it's the same for thoroughbreds as well. It's no different. The only difference is we're breeding, they're not. That's the difference. They don't get to the racetrack, it doesn't take any longer. There are plenty of two year old races. There's all the every racetrack in the country. There are track, there's two year old races, usually probably start around July, August, April, May. There's two-year-old thoroughbred races. There's two-year-old standard bread races. The top races in the world are three-year-old races, typically for both breeds, right? The Kentucky Derby. Only three-year-olds get in that race. Why is that? Most 
popular horse race in the world, Kentucky Derby, only three-year-olds. Is there a reason why you encourage two and three-year-olds to race? And the standard bred breeding program has done that. It does that, and that's why it's successful. The thoroughbred program has not done that. They don't have a breeding program. They have a program to award older horses money. That's not encouraging anyone to breed their mares back in Massachusetts. There is absolutely no, no, no good rationale for giving extra money to the thoroughbred breeding program, which I suggest is a misnomer. I would, I would suggest a move, a tick upward that the standard bred breeding program is absolutely deservedly of more than 65% of what's been allocated previously. And this is an important step. There are, there are broodmare owners all over the state that have, the, it's a three year, four month approximately process to breed a horse and to get that baby to the races. There are standard bred horses now in full, mares. To cut the funding now would be drastic to them. There's, not, there's none of that on the thoroughbred side. The only people collecting money on the thoroughbred side are owners of aged racehorses. Thank you. Brief Attorney. rebuttal. Uh, Attorney Savage, yes. So there, there's, there's no question that they, the standard breads have gone from 36 to 99 under the racehorse development fund. So giving one breed or the other money matters and they've proven it. So if you give us money, it will matter. And we're the ones in extremis. The polls for thoroughbreds dropped from 26 to 10 when the racehorse development fund started to cut the money. In more than half, it dropped by two thirds. A um, Couple other things, there's just no question that the standard bred racehorse get to the track quicker there more two-year-olds run. They have a whole stakes program for two-year-olds. Thoroughbreds can't do that. We do. We are running three-year-olds. We had four, year, four three-year-old races last year. Um, and the most important or second most important point is Mr. Goldberg correctly quotes chapter 128, section two, saying that you can spend money from your purse account. We don't have a purse account. Suffolk is out of business. We can't spend any of that 80% money the way you guys spent 2.8 million of it last year to help mass breads. So it's I just- think, not, I don't think we spent $2.8 million out of the program. That's, that's not correct information. You it were, not, it's, it's your reporting. You said that last year, 4.5 million total went to mass breads. That's in your submission. If I back out the 1.7 that's from the breeding program, you've got 2.8 left. $2.8 million was earned by mass breads in the rest of the country last year. That's where that number comes from. No money was taken from the purse account in the standard breads to put towards the, towards right. the stakes program, the breeding program. So you say that's not what your document says, but that's fine. Um, and, and then finally to the most important number and we're back to it is like a dollar to a thoroughbred breeding support program, 87 cents back to the Commonwealth. A that? dollar to the standard breads, 54 cents. That's you didn't even answer the question on the questionnaire. The standard breads didn't even bother because they know it's a killer. Okay. Thank you both. I'd ask the other committee members if they have any comments or questions for either of the industries at this time. I have, um, I think it's it's more of a comment, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, many of the breeders have been, have come before the Gaming Commission at different times to explain their programs and, and whatnot. And um, the question continually asked of the thoroughbred is, is why isn't there any breeding? I mean, I think those numbers are clear that they're, the new breeding has virtually stopped, which means older horses are getting paid. And I think the answer to the commission has been, there's no place to race. And it's, it's, too, it's too big a chance to take, it's too much of an expense without knowing there's a place to race. So I do believe that's a much bigger factor 
in the breeding than the split has been, frankly. I think it's the inability to race in Massachusetts that has really um, stopped folks from breeding and and the law did get changed so that they could pay older horses which is a way to you know keep some farms going i do i do believe that but i i i do think it is a breeding program and i do think it's important that the thoroughbreds and are just not um are not breeding virtually at all at this time And so the, the question there, Commissioner Cameron, is like, so your gut is that's about the racetrack, and my readers tell me well, it's about it, the it's not my gut at all. It's testimony before the commission and asked direct questions about why there is no current breeding going on or very little. And that's the rationale we've been given. I'm not I'm not I don't have a gut on this one. I'm I'm trying to decipher good information. Yeah, that was not the rationale that I heard articulated in the people who testified in front of us. And I obviously have to defer to you as to people who testified long ago in front of you. Well, it wasn't long ago. It's pretty much every year. And, um, you know, I, I just think that's a factor here as opposed to the split numbers, because um, years ago when there was full time racing, they, they didn't have a resource development fund to take monies from and the breeding was was much more successful. And I, I, I do think that had a, a lot to do with a, a place to race. I, but we're in common ground there. I, I think that it's not an either or, there's no question about that. It, uh, absolutely, that if there was a racing facility, that would be an additional um, impetus, but the, the split has hurt us. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if there are some incentives that could be put in place by the thoroughbred breeder, breeders so that in fact, they would be incentivized to breed and then have those two-year-olds to, to go ahead and race. Thank you. Attorney Katana. Sorry, I'm a little slow with the mute button here. Um, so I'm hearing from the thoroughbreds that they'd be interested in a 65-35 split. Mr. Goldberg, did I miss a specific split number for you that you're suggesting? No, you didn't miss it at all. I, I, you know, I, I think it, I'll say the same thing as I said on the on the purses. I think I could ask for a hundred percent with all good conscience, conscience um, based on the numbers, based on the metrics that we're charged to look at. Um, but again, I would say an eighty-five to ninety percent uh, split favoring the standard breads uh, would be. Um, very reasonable in light of the fact that there's almost no breeding for the thoroughbreds and uh, a, a, a good program for the standard breads that encourages investment and open space in Massachusetts. So um, Commissioner Cameron, back to your point, I, I, I think it's a really good point that, that the breed should consider various incentive programs and it may be grants and it may be other things, but Without the resources, we can't do that. At, at getting half the money the standard breads get, we're barely making the purses to cover the 35 or 38 races a year of the older horses. So if we were sitting here today, and we kind of are sitting here today, for the first time analyzing this uh, category, I assume we'd be starting at, well, presumptively it's 50-50. Now, what factors might move it one way or another? And, and Mr. Goldberg's factors are, you know, which it's robust. We're breeding a lot. There's lots of foals. And then, you know, our factors are, you know, the money stays in the Commonwealth and we need the money to jumpstart where we've been hurt in the past. And that those things, you know, maybe that ultimately ends us up back at 50-50 or a little bit in favor, which I've proposed of the, of the, of the thoroughbreds, but, uh, that's kind of how I analyze this. Thank you. So, uh, Attorney Katonic, did you have any further further comment? Yeah, I guess just yeah. one more quick follow-up question to Commissioner Cameron's um, comment, which I think is very well taken about sort of incentive programs that could, you know, help 
with breeding of thoroughbreds in Massachusetts? Has there been any thought about what those programs could look like if you had the resources? Yeah, we've had some discussions internally about a direct grant program, for example, where you, you pay someone literally to breed a master. And then they, they wouldn't have to take the chance that, well, I might breed it and it can't run. And then, um, you know, and, and to sort of, because we're in the place we're in, kind of jumpstart um, that. And, and two things to be candid, it's not just the money, but we're unclear about the statutory authority to do that. But it was never worth kind of hashing out with the commission because we know we can't fund it anyway. But that that kind of the the primary thing that we're thinking of is is, is along the lines of a direct grant program. Okay, thank you. And that, that can take a couple of forms. You can make grants to farms, or you can make grants for births, or and the nuance isn't you know all hashed out. But that that's where we'd like to get if we can get the resources. Okay. But but I guess it, the resources you do have, which are significant, Mr. Savage, frankly, I mean, compared to when the, before there was a resource development fund, and don't forget, it's not just the percentages, but before the pandemic, significantly more money was coming into the fund because of the opening of new casinos. Um, so I guess I'm just, there, there's so little breeding going on. This is a breeding program. I'm just, I guess I'm, I have a concern that this wasn't rather than just paying the, the money to older horses, which frankly doesn't encourage um, new breeding, why uh, some kind of a, you say you're waiting for more money to do that. I just, there was a significant amount of money before and it has not been used to really um, incentivize breeding, which is what this program is about. So the, the thing that incentivizes standard bred breeding is the ability to win purses, and they run their 35 races at Point Ridge. We believe that the thing that would incentivize breeding for thoroughbreds was the ability to win purses, plus the bonus awards. So we, we had the same structured system, but we only had enough money to fund the purses at the reduced level because we're only getting half the money that the standard breds get. And the incentive is not as great as it is for the standard breads because we have half the money. And it's played out exactly like that. The standard breads have very aggressively bred and chased the money. So to say a million four is a lot of money, you know, relative to what? Well, can I, can I just correct one thing, Mr. Chairman? You're not getting half of the money that the standard breads get. It's been 60 40 for the last two years. Now that it's 65 as of November 2019, we got 61%. So it's 60, basically it's been 60, 40. So that's, that's, it's not half the money. And you know, in 2013, before the Racehorse Development Fund, the Thurbots had 36 foals registered before any Racehorse Development Fund money. Now that they're getting money, it's dropped to, to one and two. So I think Commissioner Cameron is spot on that the extra money has not helped the breeding. Well, the, the math is the math. Obviously, the, the, the foals, you can count them. I mean, there's no disputing what you're saying, Peter, but it's like, that doesn't mean that what I'm saying is not accurate. And plus, I really keep going back to the touchstone of like, you, the standard breads got about a million seven and 950,000 of it came back to the Commonwealth. We got a million four and 1.1 came back to the Commonwealth. It's hard for me as a, as a public official, I don't know if we took oaths for these jobs or what, but to walk away from that fact that what, what benefits the Commonwealth and it's follow the money. So if racing in Massachusetts is what benefits Massachusetts, okay? Attracting outside investment is huge. One of the best things you can do for a breeding program and talk to the people in Pennsylvania, talk to the people in New York, is to you the goal here is to grab these people there are lots of breeders around the country and move the breeders into your state and that's what we've done the breeders program has been set up it's been it's been run by extremely competent folks in massachusetts not only to increase the number of massachusetts residents who are getting money and raising horses but also attracting outside investment that's key it's not a bad thing 
That's a great thing. That's what you want to do. You want people from Delaware, from New York, from Maryland, from Maine, from Iowa. We have, all, we have people from Iowa bringing mayors to Massachusetts. People from Florida bringing mayors to Massachusetts. That was never done in 2013, folks. That wasn't done. We had years back in the days when there were three horse fields, two horse fields, one horse fields. Now they're full. They're full fields and it's a very competitive program. And it's because the program has been run properly and it's been a huge benefit to Massachusetts in attracting outside investment and also rewarding the local people who have owned farms, the veterinarians, the feed stores, the gas stations, the farriers, everybody. It's been, a, it's been very, it's been run very well and we ought to apply the metrics and put the money where it's working. The 25% of the mass breads in the standard bread industry are owned by Massachusetts residents. Listen, General Electric came from Connecticut to Boston. Is that a bad thing? But these people aren't coming from someplace to here. They're staying in Maine. No, no, they're, they're not. Lindy Farms of Connecticut bought a 300 acre farm in Massachusetts, okay? Invested millions, tens of millions of dollars to develop a farm in Massachusetts for that purpose. So people are coming and staying in Massachusetts. I beg to differ. All right. Um, with that, I, I had uh, just some questions for, for both industries um, with respect to the breeding programs. Uh, and the first question really is is directed to to both industries, and and hopefully you can provide uh, you know some response um, if you feel that there's a need to defer to your representative members who be maybe on the call. Um, I'd invite them to to speak in terms of any information that you may not have. Um, but the the first thing is is. I, I just want to know in terms of delving into this and looking at the figures and the figures that have been presented, um, especially with respect to um, the allocations in terms of the distributions of the art HDF funds to mass breeders. Um, and so I know that chapter 128, section 2G and 2J uh, both require of the standard breads or and the thoroughbreds. Well, there's a reference in there that says that um, their programs can be audited uh, to ensure compliance with this section as often as the state auditor deems necessary. So I did a little research and found that uh, according to the state auditor's website, uh, the last published audits for each industry was for the calendar year ending in 2014. And those audits were published sometime in April and June of 2016. So I guess my question for both industries, and I apologize for making this a long-winded question, but has either industry voluntarily audited their breeding programs or do they have an internal audit or uh, are there audits that could be shared with this committee just so we can you know, see how these numbers actually flesh out based on the compliance with the breeding programs. And I guess I'd ask uh, Ms. Attorney Savage to um, first respond, and then we'll hear from Attorney Goldberg. So. Yeah, so, so first, I, I, I was under the impression that we've been audited more recently with that, but I, I'll, I'll set that aside because I'm not 100% certain I'm right about that. Yeah. Um, but so we, we have an independent accountant that does our records and traces the money. And uh, I don't know, and the guy who would know the answer just had to jump off this call. I don't know if that's called an audit, but uh, it's it's um, accounting function that we're confident of, and we'd be glad to share the numbers and anybody who wants to kick the tires on, on where it went. Um, I mean, it's not actually all that complicated because despite what the, uh, Mr. Cameron said, you know, it's it's a million four and you just start to list the purses that it went to pay and then the stallion awards and then the breeder awards and then there's the, the by statute, there's 8% for administrative 
So 92% of the money goes out the door every year to these the purse awards. But uh, I'll, I'll make a note to get that to the members of the committee um, uh, you know, after this meeting's over for whatever consideration in the future. Okay, thank you. Attorney Goldberg. Muted. I'm unmuted. Um, Yeah, I think that the actual audits, when the state requests it, the audits are done. I know a request from the committee recently, the um, the mass, the standard bred breeders did submit their uh, annual, all the annual records from 2019 that shows where every dollar was spent. And it shows, in, in, they do quarterly counting audits. I mean, they have to spend 92% on purses. It, up, up to 8% can go towards operating costs. And that's done every year. Um, I, I don't. I think the state audits it when the state wants to, but they keep they keep good records. And I think they provided them for 2019, and I think they're happy to provide them for any years that that you would request for sure. Okay. And do you know are are those submitted to the to the gaming commission? I guess I defer to Dr. Lightbound to so. Sorry, uh, no, they're not um, submitted to the Gaming Commission. They, um, by statute, the State Auditor's Office does it. Yeah. And um, I, n there hasn't been uh, a, a State Auditor um, audit done since the Racehorse Development Fund money has gone out. It started in uh, 2015, okay. the money going out. And I, I did notify the State Auditor's Office um, at some point, um, I don't know if it was in 2016 or 17, that yeah, um, you know, the two organizations were um, receiving um, quite a bit more money through this racehorse development fund than they had in the past. So, Mr. Chairman, my my folks are texting me, and and the accountant that that we use is a guy named Bill Robbins, and he indicates that we're audited every three years, and that our last audit was 2017. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I do have a, a question, um, I guess for you, Mr. Goldberg, and again, I guess I would defer to your representative member in case there's any detail that you may not be able to provide. Um, and when I kind of sifted through all the numbers um, that were submitted based on the, 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 the breeder expenses, um, I note that on the listing, it just, it shows the earnings, you know, the 2019 owners by state earnings by race and showing that basically a million, two, uh, $1,254,000 was granted to um, mass owners. Um, and the, the, the whole allocation for the breeding program to the standard breads as of last year was about 1.691 million, 909. So I just wanted to kind of just get information just in terms of when we're looking at these figures, you know, how is that pretty much decided in terms of those, those distributions? Because if you look at it, then you'd say, well, one could interpret and say, well, only 59% of the resource development funds were allocated to mass breeders. So I just kind of want to get some clarification as to the thought process in terms of those numbers. So, yeah, a mass breeder is not is not does not have to live in Massachusetts, okay. right? So if I own a, if I if I'm a Florida resident and I own a mayor and I say, geez, the Mass is having a great program. I ship my mayor up to Massachusetts. I, I get a stall at a farm. I say, you take care of my mare and, and you can you breed my mare for me. So the breeding season, February, March, April. So you bring your mare in, it gets bred in February, March, or April, May of that year in a Massachusetts farm. And if you're lucky, the, 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 the foal, uh, the mare becomes in foal, she conceives. And the mare then has to register by the end of November as a brood mare. And then that full, then if the, if the horse is, conceives in April, if you're lucky, sometime in March, she has the 
she has the foal. Um, and then uh, that foal, wherever it lives, it has to come back. When it starts to race, it can, it's a mass spread, right? The foal is a mass spread. The owner might be in Florida, but the foal is a mass spread. So when, the, when the, every mass spread race, standard bred mass spread race is in Massachusetts, that Plain Ridge. So they have races for two-year-olds every year, for three-year-olds, separate races for fillies, and for fillies separate races uh, for, for colts and geldings, and separate races for trotters and pacers of each, of each age and, and sex. So that's what happens. You know, these horses are in Massachusetts, but they may be owned by someone in Florida. That's a good thing. That's getting General Electric to move to Boston. That's getting investment dollars that normally stay in Florida, Iowa, New York, Delaware, New Jersey, Connecticut, and moving these people's horses. Not necessarily the people, and there have been a lot of people that have moved. That's more of the trainers who are actually training the horses. There are quite a few trainers who have moved their tax, so to speak, to Massachusetts. But in the ownership, I mean, I can own a, I can own a uh, Florida bred horse, no problem. They'd love it. Florida would love it if everyone in Massachusetts decided buying a Florida, sending their mares to Florida to become Florida breds. That's the goal of a good program. And then just to follow up with that, so then obviously then the horses that are listed on the reports, then those are all on those owners by state. Those are all horses that are registered through the mass breeding program. Oh, 100% of them. They have to be the race in those races. Absolutely. They're all mass breads. They all have to be registered on time, pay the, the fees to the Commonwealth and have to do their their due diligence in Massachusetts. Okay. Right. Uh, thank you. And looping, looping back, Mr. Chairman, and since I'm getting this information in real time, the, the audit that was done in 2017 did not touch on the racehorse development fund. So it's a, diff a different portion of their program. Okay. Okay. Um, let's just see. So uh, Attorney Savage, I just kind of wanted, and then again, I, I guess I would say just with respect to this question, if it's a, if there's some detail that you feel you need to refer to your, your representative member, um, then please invite them to, to help respond. But I just, just as a general question, I know that in terms of the racehorse development funds that were allocated in 2019, it was roughly $1,127,637. And essentially, um, 687,850 of that was um, dispersed through through Suffolk Downs. So I just want to confirm. So then the the balance of that then would have been distributed at tracks um, or through tracks outside of the Commonwealth. Yeah. Hopefully, Matt Clark is on and we'll know. You know what's fixed and what's something. Matt, are you available to speak? Ah, uh, I think I found the magic way to unmute myself. Um, thank, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk. Um, good afternoon, everybody, Mr. Chairman. Um, members of the committee. Um, I, I just wanted to try and clear up a, a couple of um, uh, misconceptions about the, the difference in, in the breeding of, of standard breads and thoroughbreds. Um, and, you know, I, I've been involved in thoroughbred breeding for 45 years on three continents. Um, and I have great experience of both live cover and artificial insemination. Um, the, the mass breeders have several of our members who have farms in the Commonwealth. Um, but over the past few years, have been following both thoroughbred and standard bred horses. Um, as Mr. Goldberg correctly pointed out, um, you can bring a pregnant standard bred mare into the Commonwealth um, any time prior to December the 1st of the year preceding following. And 
uh, most of the foals that have been born at our members' farms uh, have indeed foaled in, in January and February. Um, there is a great incentive to get your foals on the ground as early as possible, because obviously um, a foal born in January or February has a distinct advantage over a foal born in, in May or June. Um, from talking to Arlene Brown and to Winifred Sinkowitz, um, the average day of, of, of a standard bred mare, standard bred mare at their farms is only between six and, and 10 weeks. Um, they come in, they foal. Once the foal has been inspected by the DAR, they leave and they go back to their home state um, where they will be artificially inseminated. Now, Artificial insemination is obviously a, a, a purely clinical procedure. Um, the jockey club who, who run thoroughbred racing in North America um, mandate live color. And you have stallions like Justify, like American Pharaoh, that are worth literally millions of dollars, 50, 60 million dollars, covering third bed brood mares that are worth, um, you know, eight, 10, 12, $20 million. Um, the assertion that it is dangerous to the mare um, uh, is, is, is really, you know, uh, that's stretching the point. I mean, obviously it's a procedure that's carried out by very experienced people who've been doing this for generations and know exactly what they're doing. Um, the difference Really, and I agree again with Mr. Goldberg. Um, yes, it's nice to send your mare out of Massachusetts to breed to a better quality of stallion. So, if if I wanted to uh, send a mare to Kentucky, I've got to pay for transportation to Kentucky, probably a thousand dollars both ways. The mare is going to have to stay at the stallion farm for probably the minimum of a month, maybe even two months, depending on whether she takes on the first cover or not. Um, you've got significant, significantly higher veterinary exp expenses with live cover as opposed to artificial insemination. And of course, the beauty of artificial insemination is you literally just pick up the phone and order the semen and it will, it will arrive as either cold semen or frozen semen in the mail within two or three days. And your mare doesn't have to go anywhere. You don't have to transport her. And your veterinarian performs the clinical procedure of artificial insemination. Mr. So there is a vast, vast difference. Mr. Clark? That, that's it, yes, I'm sorry. I just, I, just I, my, I guess my question, thank you for, for that information. I, I just, my question was more directed towards the purse allocations and the thought process related to, you know, $687,000 out of the 1.127 million was allocated towards Suffolk Downs. And I just wanted some confirmation that the balance had been distributed through other tracks. Outside. Yes, yes. The 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 the, the mass breeders last year uh, conducted twelve races at Suffolk Downs, and then a further fifteen races at Finger Lakes. Um, and the purses for all of those twenty-seven races were taken from um, the, the their share of the of the breeders' funding. Um, I also quickly like to touch on, on the fact that uh, Commissioner Cameron talked about incentivizing breeding and there is a bill that is currently before the legislature um, which if passed would give the NTBA the right to do that and, and, and in a very very creative way um, so it, it has been well thought out um, it's a well conceived plan the only problem is if the legislature passed that bill um, in the near future, which we're hopeful they will, um, it will kind of be kind of be a moot point if you remove the funding um, that will enable the breeders to to fulfil 
uh, the intentions of that uh, legislation. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Thank Mr. you. Chair, Mr. No, thank Chair, you so much. Mr. Chairman, to follow on Mr. Clark's answer, there's a, there's a small remaining balance, Suffolk plus Finger Lakes plus the bonus program. But so it's like the stallion awards, uh, the, the, the some breeder awards and, and, and whatnot. But that, that all accounts for the total figure that you asked about. Okay, all right. Thank you. Do any of the committee members have any further questions or comments with respect to the breeding programs? Seeing none then at this time, uh, I guess I would open it up for discussion in terms of whether or not any of the committee members feel that there is a need to reevaluate and or readjust the allocation of the breeding programs. Well, Mr. Chairman, I think it's <clears throat> I think it's obvious based on the metrics that the standard bred breeding program um, is just that is a, is a well run, well organized, productive breeding program. Um, without rehashing everything, I, I would suggest that there needs to be a reallocation of the breeding money in order to be fair and properly. Uh, do our job for the residents of the Commonwealth. I mean, I suggested an 85 to 90 percent allocation towards the standard breads. Commissioner Cameron, I'll defer to you if you feel that that's too much. Um, you know, with I, I, I'm I'm willing to discuss that. Obviously, you know, I think I think it's it, it's at, at some point we have to go with the metrics though, and and really, you know, it, 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 put the money where it's working. So obviously I'm in the opposite place. Um, I think that it's time to save thoroughbred breeding and, and continue to have the money come to Massachusetts. Um, you know, maybe there's a place in between those two places called 50-50 where we treat, treat each industry equally, which I think ought to be a starting point and then Gober's got his arguments to run the other direction and, and we've got ours to enhance the direction. So that's kind of where, where we are. Um, Mr. Chair, I, um, I think it was, it was interesting to hear from Mr. Clark that they are uh, looking at other ways to incentivize. I said, but as we've said with every category, we're really looking at the difference between 18 and 19 to make these decisions. And, um, I, and when we look at those numbers, you know, it is a breeding program and the, for whatever reasons, and we don't have to try to figure out exactly the reasons, but um, there has not been um, an awful lot of breeding going on on the uh, thoroughbred side where there has been on the standard bread side. Um, so personally, I, I, I do think the numbers, I'm persuaded uh, by numbers and by listening to both sides that um, increasing, uh, and I'm again cautious, and we've always been cautious not to make swings too big, but I, I am persuaded that maybe a 5% increase would be, um, would be warranted um, toward the standard bread breeding program. If, if I could mildly dissent on the analysis, I, I, I get why we have, and I agree with Mr. Goldberg, looked at 2018 versus 2019 for the 80% purse category, because we've always analyzed that in detail. We've never analyzed this category in detail. So I don't think that we're in the same position analytically, and I think it, it's it's uh, uh, inappropriate, frankly, because that setting. So I'm not. You can still get to your seventy percent number, but I don't think that's the way to get to it. Um, yeah. I just well, offer that. Yeah, I would disagree that we haven't. We may not have separated it out, but we've certainly discussed breeding programs and coming to our overall numbers in the past. Every single year, we've talked about 
um, health and welfare breeding as well as purses, even though we didn't separate it out, we did thoroughly discuss those issues. Well, and I guess my, my view would be, but we never came to a consensus that, oh, actually it just turns out by coincidence, standard bread should get twice as much as of everything in every category, because that, that, that wasn't within our purview. So we absolutely thoroughly discussed and did our job, but I don't think we've ever made a decision um, like we're about to make, and that that is relevant, I think, to whether precedent matters if you've never made an actual decision before. Attorney Katana. Can I just interrupt? I'm sorry, because no, I, I don't know no, if this is within. No, 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 no. 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 This is, Mr. No. Chairman, this is not a public no. hearing. I'm going to object to any more representatives. Well, Attorney Katana. I'm trying to save people's livelihoods and farms here, and, and we, we put criteria together to argue, and I don't think we're looking at it. But No, no. I'm, I'm going to object, Mr. Chairman, to what is, this is not a public hearing. The Thurbreds have a representative who's more than able and they've already had extended comments by, by folks about unrelated subjects. I think we have to mute these mute people who are not on the committee now, so we're not here till midnight. Okay, yes. I, I, I've got six or seven people that would love to argue. Yeah. Uh, I have Chip Campbell, Nancy Longabardi, that would love to tell you about the standard of breeding program and go on and on and on. I don't think that's... Uh, okay, thank you. Attorney Katana. So. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you for the reminder on the time too, because I appreciate the thorough analysis that we're walking through, um, but I do have another commitment at five, so I'm gonna have to, to okay. run pretty soon, yeah. um, just in terms of timing. Okay. Um, I think in terms of sort of separating out this bucket, I do hear the argument that, you know, more funds in this category would be helpful um, to the thoroughbreds. I think I would be more persuaded if there was more of a firm um, sort of program or proposal in place, or if there was a shift to use the existing funds that the thoroughbreds are receiving um, towards, you know, the programs that are being contemplated and discussed that would be, you know, available if, if additional funds were made available. Okay. Thank you. Uh, is there at this time, I would ask or entertain a motion. Is there a motion that's being proposed by any of the committee members? Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll, I'll make a motion um, based on the Commissioner Cameron's comments. Um, I move that we adjust or adjust the split based on the, um, for the breeding portion, for the 16% breeders portion of the Resource Development Fund to 70% for the standard breads and 30% for the thoroughbreds. I'll second that motion. Okay. Any further discussion? Seeing none, then I will take a roll call vote. Attorney Katunuk? Aye. Commissioner Cameron? Aye. Attorney Savage? No. Attorney Goldberg? He's muted. <laughs> yes. And Fitzgerald? Aye. Thank you. Uh, so moving on to the next category, which is our health and welfare benefits uh, and in the interest of, of time because obviously we've spent a great deal of time and I, I hate the fact that right now that we unfortunately we are going to be uh, cut with some limited time uh, for the discussion of of this category um, so I, I i guess in following our um, prior procedure uh, in terms of allowing for any uh, brief statements, um, 
I would call upon Mr. or excuse me, Attorney Savage on behalf of the Thoroughbreds um, to make some brief statements with respect to the health and welfare uh, benefit programs uh, allocation and your executive summary. And then I would turn the floor to Attorney Goldberg and then allow the committee members to make any questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, so we now stand at the point where we've given the standard bread 67.2% of the entire racehorse development fund. Again, I think for these categories that we haven't ever considered individually before, um, that 50-50 ought to be the starting point. And I think uh, that we ought to come out slightly favoring um, thoroughbreds at 60-40. Right now, uh, again, the 65-35 saying that the that, that, uh, standard bred people are twice as valuable as thoroughbred people is, is not based on anything other than accidental collateral damage from the prior way the split was. So, I mean, the, the reality um, in terms of benefits to the thoroughbreds are just to maintain where we were on this reduced um, split number is a budget of $360,000. Um, and it, it's been cut to 275 with the 35%. And if it comes in, it, it looks like the casino money is gonna be at a 25% level in the coming year, then we're looking at going from a budget of 360,000 to 75,000. Um, and it's had real concrete impact on people. Um, we had to eliminate our life insurance benefit because of the reduction um, of the split last year. And we're really grappling with like what public policy reason would there be to, to cut off a life insurance benefit for mostly Massachusetts people right now to increase a pension benefit for mostly out of state people 10 years. In other words, the, the need here is, is immediate. Um, and if we don't get a modest increase for a year, and then we think this should just stabilize at 50-50, um, it's really going to have immediate detrimental human impact. And that's not true with the standard bread program because they're making a contribution, long-term contributions over time to a, to a pension program. Um, and the standard bread uh, oh, people in that industry couldn't access that benefit now they wanted to when we've got people on the thoroughbred side that are depending on this in the midst of a pandemic and uh, a hiatus in, in, in relationship uh, in racing. And, and, and they, again, they highlight the people, a lot of people signed up for their organization, but they, they've yet to translate that into actual um, benefit to the Commonwealth. So our, our proposal is to address the immediate desperate human need, which is a, something that's gonna be around for six months or whatever, with a 60-40 tilt in our direction, and then stabilize this thing at 50-50 because there's you know, decent people in, in both industries. This, is, this one really, not be one where people are stabbing each other um, in the back for a nickel because we're all horsemen. And, uh, you know, we're, we're asking, I mean, I asked Peter straight out, can you give us a break on this one? We got a real problem. Okay. Thank you, Attorney Savage. Attorney Goldberg? Yeah, so, you know, the, the problem here is we're talking about, I think, poor planning on the side of, of the thoroughbreds. They put in place, whenever it was put in place, a defined benefit plan. A plan that's based on current revenues to pay out people's benefits. That's great if you're IBM, maybe, or if you're Amazon, or maybe that's a bad example. But if I work for a company with a defined benefit plan, they go out of business, my benefits stop. And I know that. I have to plan for that. And I have an obligation as an individual to plan for my future not to depend on my company. The company might be a supplement to where I'll retire, but people who are 65, I don't know how many people are over 65 that are getting money. 
but there's Medicare for those people. The life insurance they're providing is small dollars. So I'm, I'm not so sure there's that much critical need, but it just a, it was poor planning. When, when HHA and E got some funds from the Resource Development Fund, it did the right thing. It sat down and spent a couple of years doing its research, doing its due diligence, and figuring out what the best way was to take care of the members in, in a responsible, and most importantly, a sustainable fashion. How to, and also, how to attract outside investment. Because what we have to remember is, again, the gaming statute that, this, that put in place the Racehorse Development Fund and the Horse Racing Committee was not designed to take care of Suffolk Downs or Plain Ridge Park. Or, or their members. That wasn't the idea. It was to take care of the Commonwealth residents. And if we're going to implement gaming in Massachusetts, how do we best effectuate a positive ROI to the Commonwealth and not a drain? So the HHANA has done that. They went out and again, they came up with a way not only to help people, but to incentivize people to come to Massachusetts. So, and I attached the RSP, the Retirement Savings Plan, and they, they looked at the health insurance and they said, we can't beat Mass Health, we can't beat Medicare. We, we, for what do it cost to provide those benefits? People are better off getting Mass Health. But what we can do is we can put we can put in place a responsible retirement program that attracts outside investment. And that's what it does. If you look at the, the pages that I've attached that indicate who's responsible, you, you get actually points, whether you're a driver or a trainer, based on the number of days you spend in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, either racing or driving or training horses. So it, it's a great program. Does it, they all, now, they're also paying for eyewear and eye care for people that can't afford it at the track. They're also giving out caretaker awards to grooms who are usually the lowest paid people to track. Uh, they paid out quite a bit of money last year for the caretaker awards. And there's also a hardship component. There were a couple of deaths last year that left some people in hard times. And the HHA and A through their health and welfare, welfare made payments to them as well. So I don't begrudge this, the, the thoroughbreds anything. I, it, it's certainly people de are deserving of what they get. I'm not telling them not to give them the money, but it's the product of poor planning. And I think the same way with the breeding, someone's got to tell these folks, get with the program and design a better plan for you. You know, if going forward, you're going to race in Massachusetts, and I, and I hope they have a racetrack in Massachusetts, but when they open it up and they start racing, you should research and it's find a plan that does the best things for your constituents as well as the Commonwealth. That's what we're here for. So we, we've talked about health and welfare before. And I think standard breds, again, just as in their breeding, um, they've done such, Alice Tisbert has gone out of her way spending hundreds, probably hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of hours, not only researching this, this retirement savings plan, but implementing it and keeping it running, keeping it funded and keeping people educated and helping to attract the outside investment. So, you know, it's unfortunate with, with the COVID, with the, all the funds being being reduced from the, from the uh, casinos, to cut funding to the health and welfare now for the same breads would, would be tragic. It ju just as tragic, no more, no less tragic, I don't think, than, you know, people lose their health insurance. On the thoroughbred side, I, I'm pretty sure they qualify for mass health or, or Medicare if they're over 65. So I, I don't think there's um, any reason to uh, split this any differently than it's been split in the past. So if I could briefly re respond, Mr. Chairman, first of all, the uh, the notion of black, bad planning is both inaccurate and offensive. We've been we've been providing benefits to our members for 40 years, and we've never been in this situation. You guys, the standard bread, set up a pension fund two years ago. So if we want to talk about planning, we planned 40 years ago to take care of our people, and we've taken care of them every year. 
there is absolutely no justification for the standard breads last year getting $438,000 and the thoroughbreds getting 288. Like what, in what way are the standard bread people better than the people that they get 150,000 more dollars for health and welfare? That to me is completely indefensible. No, it's, it's defensible because the people that are getting... And, I, and I'd appreciate not being interrupted, but if that's what you need to do, Peter, go right ahead. Well, Joe, you asked a question. I'll wait till you're done before I answer. No, I, I made a statement that it's indefensible. Um, so we're sitting here with a disparity of $150,000. Not based on any analysis of health and welfare, but based on how the overall split was done in the past. And I don't think that takes into account the needs of any of the human beings involved here. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Attorney Katanak, do you have any comments or questions for either of the representatives based on what they've just discussed? No, I just, I think I would um, hearken back to the reason why we chose to separate out the buckets in the first place. Um, which was really to focus intentionally on each specific bucket, but this bucket in particular, um, because of the human impact, that to me um, was very persuasive in making the decision to shift from allocating the entire pot overall versus looking at the items individually. Thank you. Commissioner Cameron? Uh, I was going to make that same exact point. It is the reason we're here today with three different uh, decisions to be made was the concern about health and welfare, which I share. I have to tell you, I am persuaded by letter after letter or email from folks that are hurting. And, um, and, and again, this one goes back to the ability not to be able to race. So these folks are, um, are hurting and I, and I think it's real and I am um, you know, much more persuaded on this side, uh, on this particular bucket to um, to give uh, more of a percentage to the thoroughbred folks. And, and I hear what everyone's saying that and I have no no qualms with anything that's being said. My my point, and I forget what the, your question, Joe, was quite honestly, but the money that's going out to the the yes, the standard beds never had the ability to take care of their own people. It wasn't a matter they didn't want to. They never had the funds. They, they raced on, a, 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 on fumes for many, many, many years. When the time came that they had the ability, many, many hours, in fact, a couple of years were spent figuring out what the best way, again, the most responsible way and most sustainable way to take care of people and also to encourage the investment in Massachusetts. These people that are getting paid, you know, they're people that used to work. I understand that, but it's not, they're not people who are working now in the industry in Massachusetts. And now those are the people who are getting benefits from their RSP on the standard bread side. That's all. Thank you. Well, well, Peter, uh, if I could inquire, no one has been paid out of the RSP yet, right? People are vested. They have a right to get paid if they want, but I don't know if people have been actually, I don't know the answer to that. It's a, it's, it's a retirement program. You get vested and then you can use your money at a certain age and with certain penalties. And yeah, it's, it's, I, I, I believe from the, the data you guys produced, which was very helpful and thorough that no one's actually been paid yet. Um, Attorney Goldberg, I just had just a couple of brief, or just actually a brief, brief question, just in terms of what was submitted in terms of the, uh, from the executive summary. And that was just some of the expenses that were related um, or addressed um, within the category. Uh, so in the, in the summary that was presented, there were some fees for um, out of this particular allocation, there were fees for the harness horsemen's international dues, uh, third party liability insurance program. Uh, there was an expenses paid on behalf of HA, HHA and E in the amount of $20,000 and an annual audit that was for $3,000. Uh, 
And I just wondered if you could just elaborate in terms of those expenses and how they're related to um, health and welfare benefits. And again, I would qualify that if you do need to defer to one of your representative members, you can for this specific question. Peter, you're muted. Okay. Well, who keeps muting me, Mr. Chairman? <laughs> so I'll, 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 if I only had the power. <laughs> so in conclusion, yes. <laughs> no, and I know we're short on time. Yeah. Uh, the Harness Horsemen International Dues this organization, they have to, they get a lot of help from, they have to be, be a member of that. They get help with a lot of their, where they handle their, the accounts where they handle the horsemen, it, it's just a, uh, a membership. The third party liability insurance is critical. Every member, 333 members of HHA and &E members get that. So if I'm a horse, if I'm an owner and I join the HHA and &E and my horse goes out and runs somebody over, God forbid, and they sue me, I have insurance to cover that. So it's liability insurance. Um, so the, the, the onsite vision care, um, Again, that's, that's 25 members went and got eye care that couldn't afford it and got that. Same thing with the hardship assistance program. Three members had terrible events in their life that were, they were given some funds. Um, the member caretaker awards, same thing. The annual audit was just an audit they do internally to make sure the money's being spent properly. Thank you. Uh, are there any further comments or questions from the committee members? Right. At this time, I'd call upon the committee members uh, to um, discuss whether or not they feel there is a need for uh, an adjustment to the allocation of the health and welfare benefits program. You know, I, I, I do, I, in the thoroughbred executive summary, um, Attorney, well, no, it wasn't Attorney Savage. The, the, the thoroughbred breeders were, were requested a 60-40 split favoring the thoroughbreds uh, at this time and 50-50 in the future. Um, I think that might be reasonable. Okay. So is there a motion? I'd entertain a motion to be made. I, I move that the, the split be adjusted to 60-40 in favor of thoroughbreds. Um, on the health and welfare um, category and, and just state as an aside with the understanding that we'll hopefully aim to 50-50 here on after, but that's not part of the motion. Is there a second? You're not going to second it, Peter? You can do it. Uh, am I, Mr. Goldberg, you thought that was reasonable, correct? I, I will second the motion. If that's what you're waiting for, Commissioner Cameron, I can see it in your eyes, even from, even from miles away. <laughs> so Thank, second, you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Goldberg. All right. So there's a, uh, the motion has now been made. Is there any further discussion? None. I was just I was just giving giving one of the female members of you know maybe a chance to second the motion. That's all. I'm trying to be nice. And we were we were asking you to step up because you you had just said it was reasonable. I I, so, I appreciate that. I don't think you have to worry about the two women on this uh, committee, <laughs> frankly. I, I'm not worried about anybody on this committee. <laughs> I'm worried about myself. <laughs> All right, so the motion having been made, I'm going to now take a roll call vote. Uh, Attorney Katunuk? Aye. Commissioner Cameron? Aye. Attorney Savage? Yes. Attorney Goldberg? Yes. And Fitzgerald? Aye. So thank you. Thank you all. So that concludes item five on the agenda. Uh, in terms of our next item on the agenda, which is discussion of next steps, uh, schedule of future meeting dates and industries to be 
terms of deadlines. Uh, I just I guess I would uh, call upon the members at this time to say, uh, now that we've made these recommendations uh, to be submitted uh, to the Gaming Commission, um, in terms of further discussions related to the Resource Development Fund, uh, do we want to at this time try and set forth some appropriate meeting dates? Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I'm sorry to interject. Um, if I may, I just wanted to point out a point of procedure in the statute. It's section 60, paragraph B. It says, the committee shall submit distribution recommendations to the clerks of the Senate and the House of Representatives yep. not less than 30 days before submitting the recommendations to the commission Correct. for final approval. So we need to send them over there first. first yep. um, and with everyone's assent, uh, the staff of the commission would be happy to do that. Uh, perhaps along with a link to this meeting in case uh, any context or texture uh, would be helpful to anyone who may review it. Um, and then uh, subject to the rest of your conversation and whether there'll be any uh, meeting dates um, coming up, we can then submit it over to the commission for review from there. Thank you, Attorney Grossman. So I guess the next steps would then be that this uh, obviously, our recommendation would be submitted to the uh, clerk of the House. Uh, so do we want to, at this time, uh, entertain any discussion on scheduling any meeting dates? I, I guess my instinct, uh, Mr. Chair, is that given the crazy year we're in, that we not set a date right now for anything. We may, we may need to come back and see each other sooner than we would in the ordinary course. Um, right. And, and I, I think maybe, you know, communicating through Todd or whatever, if there's things that come up and then toward the later part of the year, get the process underway for next year. Okay. I, I would just suggest that it's always good to have a date. We can change it, we can cancel it, we can move it up, we can move it back. At least if we have a date, you know, there's a lot of people on this screen here that have busy schedules, I think. I think taking a date that we can, that the committee can agree on now, at least as a placeholder, is probably a good idea in light of what's happened in the past. So are we talking in the fall? Are we thinking October or something along those lines? Even late fall, even October, November. You know, I, I don't feel I don't feel strongly about this. So if we want to, if there's a consensus date, let's grab it. Yeah, That's fine. I, I may be more considering uh, whether we state it uh, later than that in terms of after the, the racing season and you know potentially. Um, so, but it. it, I, it it can just be, you know, a, a sort of an agenda setting meeting where we say, okay, here's what's going on and yeah. let's pick a meeting date in December or January. I don't think, I don't think it needs to be a substantive meeting date, so to speak. How about, how about December 16th, just as a catch up? Okay. So unfortunately, or I guess fortunately um, for me, that's not going to work. Um, I will be most likely out on parental leave. <laughs> um, starting late October through January. Um, so my, my windows, if you will, are kind of early October or waiting until January. I'll make sure that we have an alternate and whoever it is is fully sort of briefed and up to speed. Um, but if we could set a meeting maybe prior to that, like mid-October, um, that would be my preference. Yeah, prior is tough in terms of having any reasonable numbers. When, when might you be yeah. back? In when might you be back in January? Um, early January is the plan. So, so you want to do you want to do January thirteenth? Sure. But but we could also set an October date just to set the future date. It could even be a date setting, you know, just to. I mean, whatever that Mr. Chair suggests, I just you know, January is not going to be a substantive. We're going to come in to set dates. Yeah. We we run the risk of you know ending up. So may, maybe an October date just to assess what's going on and pick and pick dates, you know, for for getting records together, getting numbers together, getting information, and before right. and that that way, if we do it in October and we set a date for early February, 
we then all have the two industries have time yep. to gather data and get our ducks in a row, so to speak. Okay. All right. So we're looking at October then. Quick. It can be a ten-minute meeting. You know, it can be a. I don't think we're capable of a 10 minute meeting, but I am not opposed to an October date. Okay, so, and Attorney Kintonek, what works in October for you at this time? I would say probably the first or second week. Okay. Well, we're looking at roughly, say, October 7th? Sure. Attorney Savage? Yep, that's up. Sure. I'll, be, I'll be due for my next haircut then, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, I, I, I get it much before then. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't go near barbers, so it's like. <laughs> <laughs> Seventh works for me. Yeah. I'm looking at my calendar. That looks fine for me as well. Okay, that would be fine for me as well. So then, okay, so we'll, we'll address uh, October 7th at this time uh, to tentatively schedule it uh, for then, for our next meeting. Um, and then um, I think at that meeting, what we'll do is we'll, we'll have a discussion in terms of setting any future dates at that time and talking about agenda items. Okay. Thank you. All right. Is there any further business or any other business that the committee members wish to address at this time? Okay. No. Seeing none, then um, uh, do I have a or entertain a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Hey. <laughs> I wasn't giving you a chance then. I was ready to go. I know you are. <laughs> So do we want to retake the motion or, or we'll go forward? That's all right. Okay, can... all right. So having a motion to adjourn, then Attorney Katunuk. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Attorney Savage. Yes. Attorney Goldberg. Yes. And Fitzgerald, aye. So thank you all to the committee members. Thank you to the uh, Gaming Commission staff. I really appreciate all of your hard work and efforts towards this. Uh, and thank you to all of the uh, individuals and representatives who've submitted letters, who worked on submitting those um, executive summaries. I really appreciate all of the hard work that you've, um, you've put in. So thank you all. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody. See thank you next you. time. Yeah. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye -bye. Stay safe. Too.